In today's episode, we interview Peter DiCarlo. Peter is a active trader who has a record of being right. If you know me, you know I like to listen to people who have been right over and over again. Elon Musk, Ron Barron, I would put Peter DiCarlo in that same category. I started following Peter about three years ago, and I kept following him because of his track record of being right when it comes to Tesla. Peter is more of a trader versus long-term investor, but he does own over 400 shares of Tesla. Peter also owns his own Cybertruck, so we do talk about Tesla, FSD. He believes that Tesla will be the biggest company in the world, and so we cover a lot about Tesla. But we also dive into options, trading, financial independence, life, philosophy, what's the point of all of this, and his story is one like you've never heard before. So with that said, thank you, Peter, for joining me today on this interview. Please go follow him. His content is just bar none, some of the best content you'll see out there. His YouTube channel is called Traders Helping Traders. And with that said, let's get into it. I appreciate you uh, joining me. I know we've never actually met, but I've been following you for, I would guess, maybe like two or three years now. I started watching you on YouTube. You just you know showed up on my stream. The algorithm mm -hmm. did its thing. And I started watching you. And I think at the time, you were kind of a smaller channel. And I was watching you, you your, your stuff was nice because it was like, uh, it was everything that my subscribers tell me to do and I don't do. They're like, you know, <laughs> nine to 10 minute videos and just yeah. really easy to consume. And every time I would listen, I'm like, man, this, he hit it. He's, he's right. Like he, every single thing you were saying is like, man, he just keeps being right. And so you just kept, I kept following you. And a lot of the stuff you were saying was, uh, I was very interesting. Like I'm, I'm a very different type of investor. I don't really, um, do a lot of short term, term stuff, at least mm -hmm. normally I don't. Um, but so it was just, it was nice to listen to you and just, you know, hear someone that was right so frequently and see how you've kind of grown over you know, the last couple of years. Cause you, you've grown quite a bit, uh, yeah. you know, in your channel and, and what you do. But, um, but l let me stop talking for a second. Cause I, I kind of would like to know things that I don't know about you. So taking a step back, how like what's your story man like like where are you from how'd you get into this um are you i'm pretty sure you're full-time doing this yep. so what like what was the jump from not full-time to full-time the was it risky was it scary like just it, pay, pay the yeah picture for us. um yeah so my first like love of what i wanted to do was to be a musician that was like the first thing and uh i go back to like that time in high school first because I feel like so many people say that, oh, I was an entrepreneur, I was flipping cards, I was doing all this stuff when I was young. And I was definitely doing that, but I also, at the time, my grandfather ran a formal wear business that came from Italy with his father, did tailoring, all the tuxedos and stuff. And so I didn't know what entrepreneurship was when I was a kid because it was just there. Like, you know what I mean? Like I never, yeah. I never realized like, oh, my grandfather's a business owner and everyone who works here, like, all the food from all the families is going to this table. And so he was like my idol growing up. And then he passed away from cirrhosis of the liver and just didn't tell anybody. And so everything he worked for in about five, 10 years was gone. And I remember just being like, dude, what am I going to do? Like, I'm not going to work in this tailoring shop. Like I wanted to take over the business. Wasn't going to be a thing for me at that time. So I was like, I'm just going to get into playing music and trying to tour. And it was a huge love of mine, got me into some bad stuff, got into to drugs and uh, a criminal background. So basically in like 2012, I got, I live in, well, let's say I think too. So I live in Pennsylvania, right? Right outside oh, of Philadelphia. Okay. I was and, gonna say, I thought you were Jersey, so. That's, no, okay. yes, yeah, everyone PA, thinks that too. It. it looks super like, super. a lot of people think I look super Italian, but yeah, it's in, in Pennsylvania right outside it's called Delaware County it's the best dude like it's so funny all my friends are like why don't you move and I'm like everyone hates it here but like I I love it man we're like 30 minutes from the beach 30 minutes from Philly two hours from New York like it's near the mountains it's pretty sweet so um I got in some trouble for marijuana and it was 14 grams that was it at the time but because I had a DUI prior to that when the police raided my house because I had a friend who was not doing well. He was coming out of prison. And I, he called me and he was like, dude, in order for me to get out of here, I need somewhere to live and I need somewhere to work. And I was like, 
can't help you with the work. Like, I don't have a job. I was like, but you can come live with me. Like, that's fine. Whatever. I was like, just don't do drugs. Just don't steal from me. Because at that time, I was like, I had already had a DUI. I was like, I'm done with all this, bro. Like, I'm just trying to live a normal life. I was going back to school at that time. And so he lived with me. He stole from me and he did drugs. So I, I kicked him that's out of the house. Bad. And You're only uh, two rules. Yeah. And he, uh, which sucked. Like, he was my, he was my boy. And so he told the cops that, I was selling pounds and pounds of marijuana and I wasn't like that. Like I was before, like no, not then. Right. And so I got in a lot of trouble. Like the cops came, I never saw a warrant, smashed the front door down. And because I was already, you know, had a misdemeanor, they had a lot more inclination and reason to believe that I was probably committing something again. And so I just sat in jail for six months. They didn't find anything besides like 14 grams of marijuana and 20 bucks. But I believe it's in most of Pennsylvania or, or most of the United States, but it's called like a gag hearing. So you can't pay bail. Like once you're acquitted for something and you're on probation, which I was on probation at the time for that DUI, you can't pay any amount of money oh. to get out. Like you just have to sit there. You can't, you can't do anything else. So I was in there just like, we're going to fight it from the streets. And the crazy thing is too, like my probation officer at the time, she was really cool with me. She's like, you're my best case. Like, you don't do anything. Like, whatever. Like, you don't even have to. I'm used to going once a month. And so I remember talking to her and she's like, I can't get you out. Like, I, I want to get you out. But like, I can't. Like, this is just the rules and the systems backed up. And so I sat in George W. Hill Correctional Facility in Pennsylvania for, I think it was like six months in total and then did weekends. And it was terrible. Like, it was, I feel like, I'm obviously, I'm just not meant for prison. But when I was there... <laughs> I was like, dude, this is terrible. But I took the most advantage as I could because even back then I was like, I don't have a phone. I don't have technology. Like, I don't have anything. And I was like, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? Like, I wanted to be a psychologist. I wanted to work with people who had addiction problems at the time. And I was like, maybe I could still do that. But like, I can't get my PsyD or my PhD or anything that I wanted to do because now I'm a felon. And so the, the whole way that worked out was after the six months of me sitting there, when I went to actually go fight, my lawyer was like, dude, I don't think they had a warrant. And he was like, and I think that we could get you off of all of this. But he was like, the issue is that if you get acquitted and they like try to like really push for this 14 grams, like you could do another year in jail. And I was like, that is not going to happen. Like I, I will just take the felony. I don't care what it is. I'm just going to deal with it and I'll have to figure it out. And so this is where trading came in because I started looking at things and saying like, Hmm, first of all, like how does money work as, as dumb as that is? Like I'm in prison and I'm allowed to read as much as I want. And I'm just like, how does money work? And started looking into the federal reserve, started looking into what actually gave currency value and realized like, first of all, it's leverage. So like whether that's, trading, not, you know, trade, like taking your account and leveraging it out, but, you know, not trading your time for money or being able to get more money on your time or hiring labor, et cetera. Like, and going back, I realized like looking at even my grandfather's business, like the leverage that he had was everyone in the family who was working towards this one common goal. And so I knew that at that time, like starting a business was not going to be the thing for me. I had no business skills. I had nothing. And so I remember that my other grandfather, he was the complete opposite of my entrepreneurial grandfather. And he was on my mom's side and he was like, you should look into the stock market. Like, I'll, I'll just teach you a little bit about trading. This was like 2015. Because I remember the first year that like I really was trading, Trump had got elected in 2016. And I remember looking into the stock market. I was reading like Investor Business Daily, the newspaper, like every single week. and. I got hooked on the idea that the market was where I wanted to be. And because I was like, it's crazy that I can't get a job at Lowe's for like nine bucks an hour because I'm a felon, but I could go take whatever capital I have, put it in the market and trade it. And it, and it seemed like such an ass backwards system. It's like it seemed, yeah. dude, it's, and it seems so weird. And so, my goal back in the day was like, I'm going to learn how to trade. 
story's going to get crazy. I don't know how far like you want me to go back, but basically, <laughs> no, 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 keep um, going because I, I don't. So I don't think a lot of people who follow me, yeah, I don't uh, probably know you. I mean, you know, YouTube's yeah. really big but small at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I stumbled upon your content based on a lot of your what you were doing with Tesla. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I think th I mean this is great to understand where you're coming from, and yeah. I, I think people like to hear stories like this, right? Mm -hmm. The I mean, not to sound corny, but it's you know the American dreams literally. Yeah. What I know where this is going to end. I think it do. Yeah, at least. yeah, but yeah, yeah, so yeah. Please, like, walk us through it, man. This is fascinating. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Because I don't, I don't ever talk about it because. One, I feel that it's, I felt like for a long time, it's just not needed. I'm on here to just give like unbiased ideas on what's happening in the market. Nobody needs to give a shit about me or my past or what I'm currently doing. But then like, as I work with my students and community members, like I forget that there are these like blocks of development that happen to me mentally that actually ties into everything I'm doing now. So like, for yeah. instance, with becoming a felon, so many people are saying to me, like, how come you didn't give up on trading? Because I, I wasn't profitable for five years. And when I look back, it was because I just didn't have a choice. Like that, that was why if I could have got a job for a hundred grand a year, I would have I done it like for sure. But it was the fact that I just built in my mind, like, this is what I'm doing. So basically at the time, it's like 2016 now, my grandmother was like, hey, I want you to get your felony removed. You're not at that point, but I want you to meet this lawyer and uh, who was her friend. And so I went and I was knocked up at his, uh, this is the another aspect that got me into trading. So I knocked up at his law office in my, my, my little suit that was all like not looking right. Like dude, it was the suit yeah. I ever had, bro. It was so bad. Yeah. And so I knocked up and I don't want to give his name away because it, this story goes south, but yeah, I, uh, I knocked up on, on his uh, law office and he's like the most charismatic man that I've ever met in my life. And we're just talking in his office for like three hours about my life and his life and what he's done. And he's like, dude, I can't get your felony expunged. <laughs> he's like, that's, that's not happening for like a while. He's like, cause you need 10 years of like fully walking away from, from probation and everything. He's like, but I want to offer you a job. He's like, I think it would be very beneficial for me to, have a younger guy around at the time. And I would like to have somebody who can just honestly, just like put more fire in me. Like, cause he was at the time, he was getting ready to retire. Hmm. And so I started working with him and it was cool. Like I felt like I had purpose. I was on the other side of the law this time. Like it was all civic related. So like going over the courthouse, handing documents, doing depositions for people. Like it was, it was really cool. And he was a big mentor of mine and he was teaching me about the market and I would watch him day trade and lose I'll a ton of money. Of yeah. And lose a ton of money. So this is what gets great. They lose a ton of money while we're working. And so I'm just like, oh, what the hell? So I'm seeing the bad side of this long story short um, with this guy. He ends up robbing a bank. <laughs> like no dude, like no joke. Um, so I find out after about two and a half years of working with him, he didn't he wasn't a lawyer he he was a lawyer but was disbarred um two years prior to me working with him and so the whole time i was working with him it was fake like he wasn't a lawyer all of our clients i was bringing documents over to the office of judiciary support and they were just throwing them out and not filing them and so like two years of me going there the guy at OJS was like you know that we just throw these out like that guy's that guy's a joke you work for blank right and I was like, oh, real dude, like my whole world's fault. Do you ever see Shutter Island? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, dude, it was like that, where like, like the guy thinks he's a cop. He's actually like mentally not there. And I was working with this guy for years thinking he's like this, the man, dude, like it was crazy. So he goes through like a really bad time and I end up losing my job with him, obviously. because I'm. And when I look back, I'm like, he was paying me like, ten dollars an hour cash used to give me cash advances on his credit card like you pick up all these things but i was so impressionable because as sad as it sounds it was the first time that i felt like i'm on the purpose. right track like yeah. yeah like purpose like i'm on the right track like and i'm not doing the dumb shit and so well, and, it was at that and point grandma made the connection so like yeah 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 oh, yeah, like, that, yeah yeah that too <laughs> there's trust there right like mm -hmm. inherently yeah. like she's 
Like she's not going to steer yeah. you wrong, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. And I felt I felt bad too because he was like just not mentally there. Like that was yeah. that was the issue. And so, um, I quit with him. And at this whole time, I was trading. Like the whole time, I would just swing trade and focus on swing trading while I was doing this. And what actually got me to the state of saying like, can I do this for a living? Was I met a mentor? He doesn't teach. I wish he did. His name's Ty Cody. I mean, he had like when I say like not the original discord server, but like there was two other guys, like yeah. my whole discord server and everything I've built. And the, honestly, it's gonna sound dumb. He doesn't even know this, but like the whole reason I do what I do from like trading perspective and sharing stuff every day is I just wish he would do it. Like I remember telling him back in the day, like, dude, I know you don't want to do YouTube. You're not into the YouTube thing, but like you should do it because everything that you know and what you teach and what you preach, like actually works. And you should do that. And he's like, I'm not about it. So I was like, somebody's got to do it. Like, I'll, I'll do it. Um, but yeah, that that was like 2019. And that was when I was like, I'm just going to make this like my full time thing. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I lost my job uh, with the lawyer and I was oh, dude. And then I feel like the, the smallest violin ever. Uh, but then, then my mom died randomly. And oh. um Dude, Damn, yeah, dude. it was it was terrible. Yeah, so I I hate I think I just hate explaining my past because it's all like this, my life is so sad type thing. But um, yeah, so she passed away, and we grew up dirt poor. She had a life insurance policy that was a hundred days away from expiring because she hadn't paid it, and when she passed away unexpectedly, I ended up getting fifty thousand dollars, and I was like, okay, <laughs> I have fifty grand. There's more money at that time than I'd ever seen in my life. I don't have a job. I can kind of trade. Like at the time, like I I understood trading, but like not to a point where I could live off of it because people did, have this. Did you have you know, the mentor at this time? Yeah. So this is at the point where I had the mentor. And okay. so I had another mentor who was an older gentleman who was like more of a life mentor. And he was like, I don't think you should trade with that money. He was like, I know you want to. He's like, but what you need, and this is like the best thing he ever said. He's like, you need some stability so that you can go and be aggressive. And he was like, if you're going to be making decisions in life from a state of needing money every month, he's like, you're, you're just going to have that issue. So he talked me into yeah. buying a duplex. And so I bought a duplex with that money. I brought a friend in just because I didn't have a job now. So I had... I had credit, but I had no proof of income, but I had the money to go put money down on this duplex. And so he came in with me and we split that property and we lived in it basically for free, rented one side out, lived in the bottom. I was driving a beater. And at the time I was on food stamps. I was like, I've got, because I, I just lost my job and I got this inheritance check and I bought that property. And I was like, I'm going to be off of assistance from the government soon. I'm going to have absolutely nothing. I need to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of this money. And it's crazy talking about this now because I have a friend that I'm, I'm actually trying to do a documentary where he's going to do this because he's at the point where I've been teaching him to trade for a couple of years, but he just hates what he's doing for a living. And um, so I drove Uber like seven, eight hours a day. And then the other time I would trade. And then all the other time I would flip stuff from Goodwill. So, dude, I had this system where you could go in with the eBay app on your phone. There's like a bunch of people who do it. And you can find mugs. Like, I know, I know this sounds ridiculous. For $2, dude, I would buy like 10 or 15 Starbucks mugs and just go home and resell them for $20 a piece. And the thing was like all of that capital, it was only like a couple grand a month. But that I was like, that is going to be my trading money. And so I started with $5,000 in like 2019. And brought that up to 50 grand in 2020. And I thought wow. that I knew what I was doing. I was trading options too. And I thought that I knew that what I, what I was doing. No idea. Like yeah. my trading methodology at the time was smart. But I was like putting 40% of my call. Like 40% of my whole capital. It was like five grand at the time. Into a position. And I would make a ton. I'm like this is great. Until like you know there's a massive pullback. And you end up losing everything. So I ended up taking all that money and just burning it entirely. And I was like, oh, 
Yeah, th- those were <laughs> those were years where everybody was mm-hmm. making it. Like yeah. 2019, 2020, 2021, it was like it, it was hard not to make money to, yeah. to be frank. You know, and everybody thought they were geniuses and to your point, you know, people got confident and complacent mm-hmm. and they yeah. started putting, you know, we saw especially in the test community, a lot of people in 2022 were starting to get margin called. People were mm-hmm. getting, you know, too big on on their options. Um yeah, it's we'll, we'll talk more about that in a little bit here, yep. but yeah, c- continue. Yeah, so that was um that was that was basically so during that time I was going to quit and I was like, dude, that was when I met that guy Ty. And I know it sounds so like cliché, but knowing somebody who has walked in the shoes that you want to be in, whether it's trading or life whatever it is, like it really does make a big difference because Trading in its own right is quite literally the opposite of everything that's natural in our human behavior and the exact opposite of everything that we're taught in school and in life. Like humans are risky, but for some reason, when it comes to like risking our future, we're like, we're really not at all. You know, like so many people would see like what I do or entrepreneurship even like as risky, but it's, it's not because you actually have the most risk out of anything like i'm not taking my my money in a 401k and and hoping that someone else is going to manage it i'm i'm managing it myself you know what i mean like yeah. it's up to me to do a good job but like if anything i'm actually taking away the oh no what if and saying oh no here's what i know um and so having my mentor at the time i was like i need to understand this like i need i need to figure out how i can actually do this and so after spending a lot of time in his community, one of the things, this is like a side thing, but one of the things that I was doing in the, in the interim to make, dude, I'm like Ed, Ed, Netty with like all of these, like, but dude, I've had like seven failed business attempts. And one of the ways that I was also making money, which that's a great is, drop reference drop, by the way, dude, the Ed, 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 balls, Nettie, dude, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah, like jawbreakers. The jawbreakers dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, dude, so during the time also of trying, trying to make money to trade with, I was learning about the Martingale. I think it's the Martingale effect, the betting system. You ever heard of it? I'm, I'm not, I'm not familiar. So there's a, a betting system and it can be blackjack um, or like three card poker, something where you're playing against a dealer and it's a 50, 50 chance. And so what you do is you would bet with $5. And then if you lose, if you win, then you just make $5. If you win again, you make $5. If you lose a hand, you double down. So you double to 10. If you lose again, you double to 20. If you lose again, you double to 40. The whole idea is that eventually, if you could double down in perpetuity, you will win one hand out of 20 and make all of your money back. Mm. And so like, it's a flawed system because long enough, eventually you're going to run out of money. But it's crazy because that's why when you go to a casino, there's minimum and maximum bet hands. It's so you can't do that. And the thing with blackjack is that depending upon where in the casino you're playing, it might pay a three to one on blackjack. So let's say the whole time, like you're just breaking even, but then you eventually average down to a hand of like a hundred dollars or 200 and you hit blackjack. Now you get paid three to one on that. So now you're back to even, but then you got paid three to one on the big blackjack yeah. and Bandul, I mean, they're, they're probably, they haven't gotten rid of it, but they have a minimum hand size of 10 cents and a maximum hand size of $10,000. And so it's because of this spread that you could start with literally $100, $200, and I'm not recommending anybody do this, and you could bet in that exact manner. You just play 10 cent hands. So for every hand you win, you gain 10 cents, you gain 10 cents. If you lose, then it goes to 20 cents, 40 cents. And basically with $100, you could, statistically, the chances of you losing 16 hands in a row, which is what would have to happen for you to lose all your money, at a 50 50 chance is like 1.4%. And so during that time, I was making like $30 an hour just gambling. Like it's not, it's not smart. I wouldn't say to do that. But after I realized like this isn't going to get me to where I want to go, it might make me a couple, you know, 100 bucks a week, whatever. I, un- I was sitting there and I was like, wait, why do casinos mess with the max hand size? Like why? Like if, if gambling size, like, and hand size wasn't such an important formula to risk. 
why would they you know what i mean like it's not yeah they do it for a reason and so i was like let there's people something... bet all the all of it let yeah them bet exactly their let them walk let and them. do whatever yeah but then i was saying to myself like no it's because the betting of not letting them bet too much but also having a minimum and then not being able to use those types of averaging down like you would do in the market and i'm not saying that that's what you should do because people get trapped in that but i realized like there is power in that because they're controlling it that is their hedge against risk that's their hedge that i don't walk in with 500 grand and hit and then leave you know what i mean yeah. that's their hedge that some guy doesn't sit there for eight and a half hours with 400 bucks in martingale effect all day and slowly take them to the cleaners it's why they give you alcohol it's why they give you all and then i started, like it sounds crazy but i started realizing like dude that's the market like they feed you with bullshit news they get you all hyped up on social media about all this stuff that's happening what these analysts are saying and then they get you to just bet more than you really should and when i was talking to my mentor i was like what how big of a position are you taking on options and he's like two percent and i was like your that position is two percent of your capital and he's like yeah and i was like so like for you to lose all your money he's like i'd have to lose like out of 500 trades like and yeah. that was when i understood like dude I'm treating, and this is why I actually hate the idea that I called my YouTube traders helping traders because I hate the idea of trading. You, you've got to be a fund manager. Like even if you're trading with five to 10 grand, you have to be a fund manager. You have to look at how do you scale this sustainably? Because as your account grows, you should be de-risking as much as you humanly can. There's no reason to be trading with like millions of dollars in options in day trades. Like, first of all, you can't even do that on the options market. You're not gonna have enough volume. You're gonna get killed with slippage. It's not worth it. But I realized at that time that there is a lot in risk management and, and yeah. actually, and it's more than just the strategy and more than just the system. Um, so, let's take a pause there mm -hmm. real quick. Cause I'm going to no. come in a, in a little bit here. Cause I, I want to take your point of view on volume and size right mm -hmm. i think um at least in my experience with option trading successfully it's checking your ego smaller size mm -hmm. more volume but mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get there in a second because you, you mentioned something about the market right uh essentially feeding you bad news and all this stuff and the difference with the bad news is not just or the the market is you know cn uh bc cnbs whatever people will call it they tell you things that almost they want you to think they're trying to mm -hmm. they're trying to orchestrate the narrative right mm -hmm. and being somebody who's so deep into tesla i see it like it's it's just mm -hmm. blatantly obvious it's like when you know something really really well and you see someone talking about it who they're just going with headlines maybe 100 level deep and it's like you're missing the whole story you don't actually understand what you're talking about yep. and that's what they're doing right so what I've noticed with your channel over over time, and you, you you tell me if I'm wrong here, but it seemed like when I first started following you, you didn't ever care or really seem to pay attention to the macro or companies were doing or mm -hmm. anything. But I think over the last, like, let's say a year, and I can only speak to this from a Tesla perspective, but with mm -hmm. Tesla, it does seem like you start, you're start you starting to talk about, well, there's a deliveries uh, number coming out or this mm -hmm. RoboTaxi event. So help me understand, like, is that an evolution? Is that just a Tesla thing? Do you not really care about macro? Do you not pay attention? Or do you think it is important to understand because it does mean something to what's going to happen? Like, how do you think about that? Yeah, that's it's, it, it's a very good observation. And um yeah, def I mean, I've definitely taken. So what I'll say is my trading philosophy and methodology, I would say is more of what's a quant trader. So like people would look at what I do and say I'm a technical analyst because I'm looking at charts. But in reality, like I'm looking at data and in order for me to enter a position, like I need a specific criteria. So for me, I do not trade unless the candle is closed. I don't care what Tesla does today unless I'm day trading. But if I'm looking at the bigger time frame, it's only on candle closure. And that was the first aspect that really helped me with being consistent was understanding now position sizing and then just trading a two-step system. At the first point, it was just what I call the 1150 impulse. So if price is trading over the 11 SMA and the 50 and the RSI is poking up, we're going to enter and just continue to ride it until literally the RSI shows a decrease. 
That's it. And so that's what I was focusing a lot in 2020, 2021, 2022 was just not focusing at all on what was happening in the macro because I noticed like, just to be honest, especially even in 2020 during the election and everything, I was like focusing so much more on like what's happening in the country and the world and COVID and all this stuff that I was like, I am not actually watching what they're doing in the market. So one of the things I'll say is that I, I don't normally focus on fundamentals. Um, what I'm focusing on is the, the technicals aspect and making sure that my requirements and we can talk about what my requirements are to get into a trade, but then I'm also watching what big money is doing. So something that I don't show a lot is I spend a lot of time watching flow scanners. So watching a scanner like black box stocks mm -hmm. and in the stock market, you cannot track buyers. There's just too many people moving around. Like if you look at how many shares of Tesla were traded today, it's probably in the hundreds of millions, right? But in the options market, it's entirely different. So it is a lot easier for you to catch up on unusual buying patterns in the options market. And the thing with the options market as well is that if you buy $100 million worth of Tesla calls, because that is a, a derivative, it's a financial instrument, it's not an asset at all, it's not going to move the price of Tesla stock. So that's how you can usually find out when they're accumulating a big position before the stock moves. So that kind of leads into what I was watching over the past couple of months with Tesla. You know, we we're seeing, and here's, and here's the funny thing too, is like, when it comes to fundamentals, I, in 2020, 2021, when I was talking about Tesla, a lot of people hated me because I was, I was like, when we would talk fundamentals, I was bearish. Right. Like, cause I'm, I'm very objective at anything. Right. I think the whole reason we're getting this awesome opportunity to buy Tesla so early is that people think that Musk is too optimistic. Like he's been talking about robo taxis for forever. So in 2022, all you really have to go off of, cause FSD wasn't that crazy. It wasn't that great. All you have to go off of is the car company stuff. That's it. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so when you're looking at like, okay, well, the company is, they're profitable. They're, they're, they are, their margins are much better, but the demand for EVs is shriveling up. And it's like, you have that whole fundamental bear case, but that's if you look at Tesla, like a car company, right? And so that's why when Tesla started really significantly pulling back, I was joking around on, on YouTube, but I'd be like, all of you Tesla bros have been telling me that this is a car company or is a, is a tech company. And now that it's falling off the face of the earth, why aren't like you know what i mean like like rem not not to be like where are you but like remember that like because because yeah. that's the thing like you have to remember your thesis when you're winning and when you're getting your teeth kicked in like that's the hardest part about trading and investing is like especially me publicly doing it like you know in a month like january where i publicly lost my ass sitting there and while everyone's like does your strategy still work do you still think it's going to happen like being like yeah we just have to continue to stick through it and you know um so the long-winded answer is I take a small amount of fundamentals and macros into play, especially macros when it comes to like inflation. Because if you would have asked me in 2021 and 2020, I would have been like, the market's going to crater. Like, dude, inflation's going to get so bad. Like, so if I would listen to my fundament my fundamental analysis, I wouldn't be long and I would have missed out on a ton of capital. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah. uh, but when I look at the fundamentals of a company, and what I think most people should take into account is you should really look at the fundamentals of the company and then use your technical analysis. Because when I was looking at what was happening with Tesla and the fact that it is, in my opinion, going to be the biggest AI play of this decade, I really do believe that next to, next to NVIDIA. And it's funny too, because like you posted, I think it was like two weeks ago but you're like who's been buying the most nvidia gpus <laughs> like you like you know what i mean like who like it's tesla like what do you think they've been doing with them like you know it's funny because you hear everyone like oh they're selling the shovels to the gold miners it's like well you should be paying attention to who's acquiring the most shovels too you know what i mean so i just felt like it was so fundamentally undervalued i felt like from a 10-year five-year play the company was very undervalued and then on top of that this is where I, I build like a lawyer. I say like my evidence, I gain my evidence of, okay, the company I want that I'm looking at, I believe is undervalued. The fundamental side, as far as like reading income statements and balance sheets, that's all good. 
I want to see revenue go up, obviously. I want mm -hmm. to see net revenue go up as well because just because you can make more money but you're burning cash like doesn't mean that much yeah. to me. But what I really want to see is the leadership team and the executives. And I want to see, and especially like with Elon now, like optimism. And I think that that's like the biggest thing that has really changed, I would say from Wall Street's perspective over the past couple of weeks is like they're finally understanding the FSD is getting to that point. They are finally understanding how disruptive like RoboTaxi is, and they're actually stepping in. And I think that that's my biggest um, gripe with fundamentals is that like a company can be undervalued forever. Like the only thing that's going to move the stock up is if other people who actually have enough money to move the stock collectively believe it, that you think that. If they yeah. don't, it's not going to go up. Like, you know what I mean? It will just, it's a falling knife until that occurs. Well, I, I would say that th there is a certain point where you make enough, you know, net operating revenue, your margins are really good. Like whether investors are in or not, mm -hmm. really good margins, really good, mm -hmm. you know, cash on, on the balance sheet, no mm -hmm. debt will force investors to yep. step in. It, it'll be, yep. I mean, it's, it's it doesn't matter what they want to do right because i think mm -hmm. wall street manipulates a lot of things oh, yeah. um i mean i think you see it everywhere but that will force a hand i think that's what's happened with tesla my my, mm -hmm. my view um just to touch on the ai part it's it, it i just i i believe in i mean i'm an engineer by by my degree and all that but just i i love keeping things simple and mm -hmm. my my post on on x was essentially saying to uh, to reference what you're talking about. All you have to do is look at who is buying the most NVIDIA GPUs, couple that with who is building out an AI offering mm -hmm. that can replace a human that can, that's very difficult to get the data. It makes it very proprietary. And there's only one company that's doing that because everything you see with open AI, with Anthropic, all these other companies, they're all using internet data. That's everybody mm -hmm. can get that. You saw Meta yep. catch up real quick. You've seen Elon with with uh, Grok catch up relatively quick. They have a new model that's gonna be coming out soon. Like, look how quickly they did that. How yep. many people do you see catching up with FST? Right. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. It's there's none. And so you, you take those two, and it's, it's very simple. It's very mm -hmm. simple. And he's the only one creating something that can replace someone. Like ChatGPT is not gonna replace anyone. It's just not. No, it's an efficiency it's tool. And it's great. Don't get me wrong. Like, it's a great efficiency tool. It's not going to replace someone. FSD mm -hmm. will replace drivers. Yeah. And people are like, oh, well, what about Waymo? And it's like, yeah, Waymo's doing great things. But like, the crazy thing is you can just go buy a Model 3 and then hook it up to the robo-taxi network. They don't have to send LiDAR and hardware to your house. And then you have to yeah. calibrate it and all this. You know, it's like when you look at what he's been building and, and he's been a very optimistic guy. You have to be like, you, you have to be, you yeah. have to be optimistic. You have, you have to be. And it's one of those things where like, yeah, he's been a little overzealous with everything, but he has actually stood by everything he said he was going to do. And it's crazy because there's so many people out there. I feel who like are not business owners and not investors and just don't understand how hard operations are like just how hard it is. Yeah. Even if I gave you all the money in the world, go build a supply chain, go operate a company like that. You can't. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's, that's, there's so many people who raise capital and just fail. So it's like, I feel that everything he's been building out up until this point and where things are going, I, I totally agree with you. And it's going to replace, it's not only going to, like you said, replace people, but it's going to, I really think change a lot of the way that we travel because there's a lot of people oh. won't need cars. You're not, you don't have to worry as much yeah. about safety. Well, like, you're in PA. Let's say you had to go yeah. to Boston. Why mm -hmm. would you take a flight to Boston when you can 100%. just take a robo taxi, yep. leave when you want to leave, mm -hmm. pack as much stuff as you want, no TSA, none of that. Yep. Don't have to worry about weather. You you yep. can you can drive, leave at two AM, sleep all the way there. Like it, mm -hmm. it changes everything. Cities. Yep. Why do we yep. need to have parking lots everywhere? Why like mm -hmm. you could have underground parking garages with like everything will change. Houses don't need garages. Like yeah. cities, towns, everything changes at that yeah. point. So yeah, yeah it'll be crazy. I think, yeah, especially like you said, with short-term travel and stuff, it's like, there's, there's, why would you not, even with me, if it was under five, seven hours, especially if I could work, you know what I mean? Cause it's like, you show up to the airport and it's all right from here to 
Florida is like two and a half. Like maybe I wouldn't take one to Florida, but Florida's two and a half hours, but you still got to show up two hours early and then you have to wait. Yeah. They have to come back. Like if I could just chill in the car for 12 hours, I also like, I, you know, I feel like, It's going to be so disruptive, even on a small scale of just going down to the grocery store, because it will be so much. E you're not going to have to pay as sad as it, as sad as it is. Like the, the the biggest cost is a human. Like the exactly. biggest cost is is labor, and that's also which is another thing that's really sad. That's your biggest risk. Like yeah. as a company, that's your biggest risk. As Uber is the same assets, the driver. And yeah. uh, I totally I totally agree, man. Like I I I'm very very bullish on tesla so, for the future well we'll get more into tesla in a little bit here yeah. but i want to kind of deviate back a little bit mm -hmm. um so right now do you when you trade are you mainly doing mm -hmm. options um so what i mainly do is about 60 percent shares and then the rest is options um i'd be honest with you like i would not be trading directional options at all if i did not have a community and a presence on the internet um i've been doing this publicly since 2020 and one of my goals is that like, I'm not, I say, but like, I'm not here just to sniff my own farts every day to just be like, look at what I'm doing and look at how I'm doing this. It's like, if people in the community are not becoming better traders, and of course it's still a statistic where most people fail, but if I don't actually see that I'm making a direct impact, then it's not gonna matter. And so I could sit here all day and be like, oh, I'm trading $2 million worth of shares and I'm making, four moves all day, people aren't going to do that. Realistically, yeah. some guy like me five years ago is going to come into my community and he's going to be like, oh, Pete has a historical success rating of 70% and I'm going to take my five grand and load it up into options. And so for the longest time, I was like, I'm just not even going to talk about it. And then I was like, no, like I have to, I have to make sure that what I'm sharing with everybody else is a system that's applicable to everybody else. And so I was like, what I'm going to do, which I'm not condoning this, but like, it's kind of being the parent who let you drink alcohol when you're a kid. Like you're going to give me your keys. You're going to, I'm going to teach you how to drink that. You're going to drink this, like, like, you know what I mean? Like, don't do yeah. it. But if you're going to drink, drink in my house, don't drive, you know, watch a movie, whatever. And so when it came to options, I was like, all right, I'm going to teach people how to trade options. I'm going to teach people what my risk parameters are, and I'm going to show them. And actually, and this is the hardest part, try to explain options in a very simple manner that people will be able to understand what actually gives it its value and what makes it decay and so right now it's about 60 40. okay so me and really what my channel is about is mm -hmm. you know it's called investing against the grain because i don't believe in diversification no, i <laughs> fundamentally think it's warren buffett said my first episode i ever had was literally a clip of Warren and um, um, uh, Munger saying that mm -hmm. it's just a hedge against ignorance. And I fully believe mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I've made, you know, all my wealth essentially all in mm -hmm. on Apple, then all in on Amazon, now all in on Tesla. And mm -hmm. it seems like I don't see a point of having a plan B, but I believe in long term investing. Like I believe mm -hmm. in dollar cost averaging, having investing in the company, in the thesis, in, in the CEO, right? For, so for me, it was Jobs, it was Bezos, it was Musk, right? I, I believe in that. But on the side, I do like to, uh, you know, you can call it gambling, you know, yeah. uh, take little, little things here and there. And what I primarily do at this point is I sell options. I yes. am a premium slut is the way I would mm -hmm. say. Yeah, dude. You know, yeah. That's what I do. My my point of view is if I sell an option, right? Let's say mm -hmm. I, I sell put. Stock can go up, I make money. Stock yep. can stay the same, I make money. It can go down, it makes money. If it's in a stock that I believe I have conviction on, maybe I get, you know, I, I get assigned, I got a discount. Yep. So that's how I see it. So I tend to really only sell options mm -hmm. and I tend to use, um, you know, I, I'll look at like, you know, Fibonacci retracements just to, you know, if I want to sell a call, maybe I want to do a spread, I sell a call, I sell mm -hmm. a put, you know, like I, I do it pretty far out, out. I use like maybe 20 deltas. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I try to just go with uh, the stats, the statistics, right? So 80% chance I just collect a premium life is good. 
what do you do with options? Uh, I, I've found it really hard to be mechanical and consistent mm -hmm. to buy options because when I buy it, it's very directional and I need it to actually move. Yes. If it doesn't move, time works against me. You know, it, it's just, everything goes bad. So mm -hmm. walk me through how you think about buying versus selling uh, and maybe even time duration. Yeah. So I would say every trader's goal should be to predominantly live off the market selling options, selling cash secured puts. Like what I, what I'm going to be focused on is teaching a lot more of like, once you get to that point where you have a couple hundred thousand dollars and you want to do this full time, or you just even want a consistent way to put towards your retirement, like selling cash secured puts and selling options is by far the safest, smartest thing that you can do. The only downside is you pay short-term capital gains, which does suck because you're, you're holding it less than a year, but you're basically getting paid to put a limit order in. You know what exactly. I mean? So I think that that's the ultimate goal. And, and since I was like, this is like 2019, I had on my whiteboard 2.5 million make 1% a week selling cash secured puts after taxes. It's like I would end up making 52% a year. I'd make like 500 grand a year. That was my goal, like after everything. And I noticed like, yeah, 95% of traders fail. And it's usually because of options, right? Exactly. You have to think like predicting price movement, like directionally on its own reliably is tough. I have yeah. just historically a 67% win rate. So that's still like, that's great, but most people, it's hard to get to there. Then you're going to tie in the risk of now it has to move within a given time period. It's just, it's making it unnecessarily hard on yourself. So I say to a lot of people, there's really no reason a lot of the times to be trading directional options. Where directional options work, like actually buying an option, is in a sense where you have massive upside with very, very little downside. And yeah. the other issue is that it has to be unimplied. See, people yes. like, they'll, they'll hold Tesla calls through earnings. It'll probably be people who will hold weekly calls through earnings coming up. And let's say Tesla rips 15%. They're gonna look the next day and be like, oh, I'm gonna be up 5,000% and I can retire. And they wake up and it's up 100%, which is still great. But they're like, what the hell? And it's like, well, because that's priced in. Everybody yeah. knows that that day is earnings and we have an implied move and it's it's not going to matter. So yeah, I, I think selling cash secure puts is the best, especially in high implied volatility times. Because when your implied volatility is higher, the premium is going to be higher. So you can make more money off of selling that. And the, like you were saying with Fibonacci's, that's like, that's the perfect move. If I didn't do anything publicly, if I didn't share anything and I just go crawl back into my retirement and just sell, I'll, that's all I would do. I would just sell cash secured puts and then I would probably go start some boring business. Like I love business and that's what I'd probably end up doing. Um, but what about ca cash? What, what about, um, covered calls? So covered, so this covered calls, I don't trade a lot because I hate going against the market in general. Like it's, yeah, I know it, it I, hurts my I've, soul. Yeah. What I've noticed is that it is just easier. And here's the thing too, right? So like you said, you're, you're a, a, a selling put or a selling puts whore or premium whore. That's what you said, a premium yeah. whore. Premium like whore, I'm yeah. that way, but I'm, I am so unattached to whatever the asset is. I just need an asset that is trending and that has money behind it. That could be gold, silver, like I, I don't care whatever it is, like whatever it is, that's what I'm looking for. And the thing too, is when you look at, at big money, the reason that I, I do that and I never go short is that there's big money doesn't stop. Right. So not to go like, I want to get back to the options thing, but like they understand cash is worthless. It's funny. Like so many people that you hear when you start trading, like cash is king, cash is king, dry powder. That is true. But we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Like at the end of the day, currency is not backed by anything. It's just paper. They understand it. They would literally rather take that cash and put it in like a wheat future, like then okay. just have the cash sit there. And so what they do is they rotate. They will take the money out of sectors that are now overvalued, which is unfortunately looking like, like semis and chips in the short term. We'll see what happens with earnings. And now you're seeing things like oil XLE is, is running. You'll see small caps like IWM is starting to run and they do what's called a sector rotation. And so what I look to do and what I teach is finding where that sector rotation is 
and then that's where I look to play the 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 reversal by using indicators like the BX trender, which shows, you know, like are they actually buying the bottom? Is there bullish accumulation, or is this just going to be a break right through a liquidity level um, into a lower low? But I think that when it comes to trading directional options, like you you can do well and you can actually not have that much risk. It's just no. You have to realize with options, right? And this is this is the other thing too. Um, when it comes to options, is that people think that trading is I'm gonna buy when price hits this level, and then I'm gonna sell when it hits this level. And it's like if you just have one target, like that's not realistically going to happen. So so it's like for me when I look at an option, if you're going in with five percent of your account. Let's say you have $10,000, you go in with 500 bucks. You have to assume that you're going to lose all that money. That's why we're only going in with 5%. The worst drawdown from this position will be 5%. Now, let's say it's an instance like Tesla right now over the past couple of weeks, which I've publicly made close to $400,000 on calls with Tesla. But look at what I was doing. I didn't just, now I'm holding it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm waiting till it hits 270. Like, no, bro, I'm covering positions. I'm selling yeah. half. So normally what I'll do is when, like with Fibonacci's, right? So when we're seeing like a breakout, I will sell half of my option at equal high because the chance of us getting rejected is pretty high. Like the chances of price pulling down in a bull trend and hitting an equal high is pretty high. The chances of it continuing that trend, little less. So what I normally do is as price will pull back into the market bias, which is basically a tape indicator that I use, that I put my own settings in, that draws a 0.618 Fibonacci for you. So if you don't know how to draw Fib lines, it just shows you in a line. And all I do is when price pulls back into that level, I buy. If it bounces and hits equal highs, I close half of my position. So now, even if it rejects and it pulls back down to where I got in, I'm still actually up. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I even, that would be normally break even if I didn't close this trade, close the trade, but we did at least lock some profits in. So from yeah. this point, you could allow that trade to run. You still have some upside to it because we're in with half of the position, but your overall downside is so much lower now. And I think that that's the problem is people going with way too much money. They do not have actual stop losses and they do not accept the risk. And I just think that that's the the reason why so many people fail with options is they don't actually accept that they can lose the money that they're putting up because when you're trading shares you can almost like i don't want to say lie to yourself but you can be like i'm owning an asset it will eventually come up like it's not a lie right because you are actually owning an asset it might take a year you know what i mean it might take a day but the problem is with an option you're not getting the money back yeah. Like you're just not like this week I was, I had, at, I had Nvidia calls. I'm not getting that money back. That thing expired completely worthless. You know what I mean? So I, I think that that's the issue is when people take options, they're not expecting to lose the whole position. And from a human behavior standpoint, it makes sense. Why would you take a trade if you think you're going to lose? I do it every day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I do it every day. That's why I don't, that's why when things are good, I don't pretend like I'm the best because it's not me. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, it, it, it's, it's not me doing anything. I'm just following the strategy. That's what you should be looking at as an investor. And as a trader is like, not what's your P and L this month or this year. It's like, are you following the strategy? Just like in fitness, like, are you eating what you should be eating? Are you doing the workouts? Like the muscles and, and, and your cardio and everything will come if you're doing the disciplined shit that you're supposed to be doing. And um, for me, that's why I, I think that I've been successful in what I do. And from an option standpoint, I think that what's given me a lot of success is not trading with massive percentages of my portfolio. Because even a week like this week, I'm down 15% on my fund. That is a shitload. But I might have a 30% pullback. I have no idea. And it's not like, I'm doing anything wrong. I'm just, the patterns fail. And yeah. uh, I think that that is a healthy way to look at it. Because if you think that you're the one that's doing it all the time, then you're going to feel the higher highs and you're going to feel the lower lows. And the sad thing is, man, like a lot of, 
a lot of people take their life straight up, like losing money. And a lot of people lose money. And I've seen a lot of horror stories of people like reverse mortgaging their fucking house to like trade. And yeah, I feel crazy. that like, dude, and it's, and it's nuts, man. But it's like, because they think that they know something somebody else doesn't. And so like, I almost attack risk and attack the way that I look at the market, almost like a simpleton. Like, oh, look, there's a pattern. I'm going to take it. Oh, it failed. Oh, look, there's a pattern. I'm going to take it. Oh, it made it. Oh, look, there's a, and it's like, if it's simple and repetitive and it seems like it's so boring, you're doing it right. Like, I feel like I get on YouTube every day and just say the same thing over and over again. And I'm like, why do people even want to listen to this? I don't get it. But that's, yeah, I, that's the bread and butter. That's the, that is, that is the difference. You know, that's why, that's why I, that's why I do it. Like, honestly, that's why I still do YouTube so much. And even with X and like posting my profits and my losses every day is because like, it makes me better. It makes me remember like, dude, go back and look at January and look at your returns and look at how you felt and remember that and watch vid videos of you at that point. And like, I don't know, it sounds like so, I feel like I get too philosophical with this shit sometimes, but it's like, sit with it. Remember what the crap felt like because you have to deal with it again. It's going to happen. It's just going to happen with more money. Like, you know what I mean? Like there is yeah. going to be a time where you're going to have a drawdown of 30 to 40%, whether that's COVID, whether that's whatever it is. Like, so instead of saying, how can I not deal with this? This doesn't feel good. Just know it's coming. And you, you, you know what I mean? Do you, um, I forget his name. It's Alex something. He's a famous um, rock climber. He, he free solos, so he doesn't oh, use yeah. anything. Um, I forget his name, but uh, I, I was at a conference where he was speaking at and something he, he was saying was what, you know, before he goes free solo, he'll climb it obviously with harness and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but the whole time he's climbing, he's thinking about falling. He's yeah. thinking about what happens if I fall here? What happens if I fall here? Because if he doesn't, the wrong time to think about that is when mm -hmm. he's up there free soloing without anything. And to yeah. your point, the wrong time to think about I could have a 30% drawdown is mm -hmm. when everything is going well and all of a sudden yep. you get hit and it's like, Oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? What, how do mm -hmm. I get out of this? Like what, what's my action, right? You, you don't know how to, how to deal with that. And so I, I think that resonates a lot with what you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying as far as, you, you know, you, you're, you're saying have a, you know, follow your system, follow your system. I, I mm -hmm. call it being mechanical. Right. Yeah. So same kind of thing, like you, you have rules in place and you stick to your rules and yeah. you should keep them. You should always question the rules, but you should keep them and stick to them. And if you start to, to you know, deviate, you, you need to, you know, have a self-reflection on there. But, but like for me, I, I, I have rules like I only I only sell options against stocks that I follow very closely mm -hmm. because I it's almost like. um I don't know. It's like you get to a certain point where you just know the way a stock is moving mm -hmm. and you know when the sentiments are up or down. And so for me, it's pretty much Tesla and NVIDIA. I follow yeah. those. I look at them so much every day. I know everything's happening with these companies that I know where the sentiment is. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it gives me confidence to, to, you know, trade in and out of them. And everything I do is really just based around statistics, you know, mm -hmm. It's just a bell curve. What are the odds of it getting to this price or not? And should it get into that price? All right, fine. I'll buy it or I'll sell some shares. Like I, I already know what my exit plan is. But to your point, I, I have a rule that, and I'm not the best at following this because you know when you're making money, you're making money. It's nice. But for the most part, once my sold options hit 50% profitability, mm -hmm. I'm out. Yeah, I, I'm out of it. And my well, logic 70. is. Okay. Yeah. So my yeah. logic is why would I risk 50% or 51% for that 49 for that 48? Mm -hmm. That, that makes yep. no sense. It, mm -hmm. you might as well get out, take, take the winners. But for example, like today I had a bunch of, um, uh, a Tesla, uh, uh, covered calls, you know, two seventies, two, uh, or two seventies, two sixty fives that were expiring today. I was like, all right, I'm letting those just go. 
right? Yeah. Like the, yeah, it's not going to be I knew it was free yeah, money. So, yeah, so it's not always, but those were mm -hmm. weekly, so I could just see where I was going. But, but yeah, I, I believe so much in just being mechanical about it. Yeah. And once you're mechanical about it, you know what it takes for you to enter. Um, it just it takes all the guesswork out of it. It takes all the emotion yep. out of it. And, you know, you said something earlier about, um, before when you're telling your story that you could trade in the market, but you couldn't get a, you know, a $9 an hour job at, you know, yeah. wherever, you know, and it, it's funny you say that because it, it's that whole asymmetric, you know, risk and reward thing. Whereas when you sell options, they say it's riskier. Mm -hmm. Right. They say it's riskier because you have so much loss. Whereas if you're directional, if you buy an option or buy a put, well, your your loss is only whatever you have there. Yeah. Yet in reality, statistics would say that riskier uh option contract if you sell is actually less risky. More. Yeah. Not risky. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's like it's funny how it's so different. It's well, exactly, because people look more of what do I have to lose, not what's my chance of losing. It's it's why people buy lottery tickets and play the daily yes. numbers still. It's like, well, I can put two dollars a day into this and what if I hit? And it's like, or you could save all two, you know, 195 days and sell options on you know what I mean? It's all it's all yeah. it's all perceived risk. And um like you were saying, making it mechanical. Like I don't I don't know much about engineering or coding and stuff, but the way that I think of it is like my requirements are webhooks. So it's like, I'm yeah. not sending the webhook. It's just like my requirements are met. And then the webhook is like, time to move. Time When this does this, we buy. Well, how much do we buy? Well, looking at the fund, how much do we have? What is this percentage? How much is allocated? Okay, now yeah. we move into this position. And so that's that's like look learning. So I, I did this like past two years. 2024 is like the first year that I came out since like 2020 from my my like 12 hours a day inside of this office. Um, and so basically I sat there for the past two years and I was like, still trading, still doing my thing, but I'm going to spend an extra five, six hours a day on top of that, just back testing strategies and trying every single indicator I can fathom, every single setting, all of these things and back testing as much as I possibly could. And it was one of the best things that ever happened. Like I ended up finding six, seven different strategies that I liked, ended up looking at all of the risk, understanding game theory, like learning game theory and perceiving risk in that sense is, is is massive. And it ultimately led me to just going back to what I was doing in 2019, which is like yeah, swing funny. trading, selling puts. Because I realized like, okay, there's so much more I can do, but is it worth me doing all that? Like, is it worth me work? See, that's the thing that people don't even realize. And it's it's like, yeah, go, like being full circle, like it's such a blessing, but it's like having no money at all, living in my car, coming out of prison to like now being in a blessed situation. It's like, I would hate me to say like, it's not just about money. Like, you know, but it's like, it's, it's not like no amount of money at times is worth like the worry. That's what I look at. Like how much worry is this going to bring to my life? How much more unnecessary stress? Like you were saying with selling cash secured puts, once you, once you recoup 60, 70% of your premium, I think to myself like, okay, let's say the max I could have made was a thousand dollars. And now I'm going to make, I, you know, I made 700. Is it worth me checking the phone three more times and not hanging no. out with my girlfriend that day to make an extra couple hundred dollars? And it's like five years ago, I would have been like, yes, it is bro. Shut up. Like it is like, you know what I mean? Like we need that money. But there becomes this point where it's like it's just better to have your system and to dial in what it's like what what makes you feel better man like yeah it's so yeah. weird but it's, i said to my students a lot where good no oh, no you fin finish your thought oh no i was just say like a, a lot of my students um I like what I want to do is I want to help people who are obviously starting out trading, but I always tell them like, you're not going to take five grand and turn it into 500 grand. Like what you need to do is have a skill, get really good at that skill, go get paid six figures outside of the market. That should be your goal. If you can, I, I couldn't cause I'm always a felon, but that would have been my, my track and then live off of as much as you possibly, like as little as you possibly can and start to put the rest in. And it's like, I have so many students in the Academy that, work full time and they have great jobs and they love what they do but like they're sitting there and i'll see them they'll follow my day trades and i'm like bro why are you following my day trades i know you're at work i know what you do like you know what i mean like what do you what do you do and they're like oh well, I, I thought maybe i could make some more and i'm like 
you get paid so much like you know what i mean like don't st- i call it like i call it the woman in the wed- uh, red dress like matrix but it's like stop paying yeah, attention yeah, to that. Yeah, stop yeah. like dude like eyes on the prize have your job have your career the things that you love learn all this stuff check the market once a day 3 30 to 4 check the daily candles like stop and that's that's the thing where it comes to trading and honestly just life i feel like that robs a lot of people from success is the woman in the red dress they're like oh normally i sell options and it works really well and i do this but like this time i'm gonna buy a bunch of calls it's like no like you know what do what is working and i'm not about not growing or not learning and if you want to learn how to trade options cool take 20 percent of your account take 10 percent of your account if you have off every thursday and you want to day trade take five percent you know what i mean i feel that uh, especially with trading is so many people are in such a rush you know what i mean like they're in such a rush to to just make as much money as they can and it's like build the skill the government's going to take 40 percent of it anyway like you know what i mean like you're gonna at the end of the year you're gonna be like oh, i made so much but like if it's short-term capital gains and depending upon what you're paying in taxes like it's more about building it's it's so it's so simple it's about building the skill because when when you have the skill and when you have a system and when you know what you're doing the losing days aren't as hard because you've been there you just know like it's it's like being I, I made like a, a voice note on X, but it's like it's like being in shape and then you have pizza on a Saturday and a burger and you wake up bloated. It's like getting back to feeling good is not yeah. that hard. But if you've been on a bender for like nine months, like it's not you're not going to know what good feels like. And so it's the same thing with with me where like I'm easy taking losses because I know that, OK, there might be another 10 percent pullback in my account. There might be another 20 percent pullback. It's going to suck, but I'm going to make the money back and I'm going to make even more than that. The hardest part for me is the public aspect of it because not even like my reputation or that like if I take a loss, people will make fun of me. It's more of like I know people are following my trades and I don't want them to lose money. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want that to happen. Even if they go and they over risk and they do whatever, it's like I still don't want that. You know what I mean? Like that's, it's, that's, it's, it, that's hard. That's yeah. hard. Cause yeah. you, you know, I, I love your, how you tie it, you know, to, to work out in the gym. Um, mm-hmm. you know, w- me and my wife, you know, we love working out. It's mm-hmm. exactly what you said. You know, you'll have like, I'll have a Chipotle one night for dinner. Cause we don't feel like cooking mm-hmm. and then you just feel it the next day, especially yeah. if you're, you know, if you're in shape, it's like, you feel it, you feel it at the gym. You're like, Oh, we gotta just eat clean now. Um, but you know, Tying back to what you're saying, everybody wants to get rich quick. It, it, mm-hmm. It's crazy. And it's a symptom of social media, people talking about, you know, it's not even just like people, what people talk about with their investments, but people are like, oh, look at me on this vacation. Uh, look what I'm doing. Look what I just bought. And you don't see the the struggles yeah. behind it or you, you don't see the fakeness of it. Right. I, um, I knew this girl who she would uh, go on a cruise, pay like 500 bucks do a cruise, take all these pictures, have all these different outfits. And then she would slowly post them throughout the whole yep. year yeah. to make it seem like she's constantly on the move. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. she lived at home with her parents. Yep. You know, and yeah. so people just see the, you know, what people want you to see. And it's almost hard too, because no matter how genuine you try to be, especially now, you, you know, you're definitely starting to hit your stride of success. I mean, obviously yeah. you've been success, but like now it's like, um, yeah. now it's like, all right, a $50,000 days, not yeah, nothing, past six months. Yeah, crazy. exactly. Yeah. So when people see that, well, they didn't see all the other stuff. They didn't see yeah. all the other years. They don't see all. And, and even if it's out there, the content, they're not going back yeah, to look at it. Like, oh, it. I remember when this guy was starting with like 50 grand and yeah. he was just going small. And so the, the biggest thing that I, in my opinion, the biggest thing that can help with anybody like, I think you should always start off with just investing, this is my opinion, in, in stocks. Find good companies, mm-hmm. set yourself up, right? But then not with, well, you can with more. Margins a whole different. But on the yeah. side, I think you can use that that and, you know, skim. You know, kind of like what I'm talking about with premium mm-hmm. or, or, or what you do. But the critical thing there, more than anything, and it's not sexy, and I don't hear enough people talk about it. You have alluded to it a few times, but I imagine people listening have just kind of glazed over it. 
small positions, yeah. small positions, because if you lose that position, who cares? Yep. Right. It, it, it's to me, it's been the, you know, I've made lots of mistakes. Everybody's lost money with, with options one way or another with the stocks, et cetera. But the thing that has stood the test of time is when I'm small positions, I make better decisions. Yep. I don't worry about it. I have no problem walking away. I have no problem just not thinking about it. Um, if I lose it, whatever. And I can do more. I can have more yep. volume. And over time, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, the whole blackjack reference, but like over time, if I'm playing, if I'm doing something where the odds are in my favor, in my example, like I said, in 80, 20 with the yep. Delta, the odds are going to play out in my favor. Mm -hmm. So you just have to no let it to risk. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. And it's, it's so counterintuitive to do yep. more because the more you do one, you learn more, but you're allowing the statistics to work in your favor. Yeah. And that's um like, if you even look at how many positions I've taken this year, it's up to like 1600. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're, wow. that's the thing Like you have to, but, but it's not like I'm even sit, like even, so what I, the way that my strategy normally works is like, I'll sit down every single Sunday and I'll live stream with the team. Cause normally I, I would just be doing that anyway, having a tea. And what I do is I look at the weekly charts and I just look at the market bias, which is basically just think of like a 20 and a 30 SMA, but there is volume incorporated in it. And my only requirement is what is trending. I scan through about 500 stocks manually and I see what is trending, what is having bullish accumulation. So if there's been anybody actually buying and big money buying into it, and then every Wednesday I make a list of about 10 to 20 stocks, depends on what it is. Like this week, it was AMD. I got cratered. But it doesn't mean that before this week, AMD was not trending over, that we weren't having an expansion, and that it didn't look like we were going to bounce. So you have to think, if I have 20 positions, let's just say like we only have 10. So we have 10 positions open, each is 5% of the account, max we have up is 50%. That's still a lot. I'd say you go to less, maybe lower your position sizing. But you have to think like this week, XLE did amazing. Those calls might have tripled. Mm. Uh, Caterpillar, CAT, that was up massively, did pull back today. That might have been a big win. Um, IWM, I had July 19th calls for IWM. Those alone made up for NVIDIA, made up for AMD, made up for Shopify, made up. So you, so you know what I mean? It's like so, so, you're playing with so many little positions, but it's kind of like I look at it like a game board, like chess. And these are my 20 moves. Like they're all equally weighted because I'm not going to say this one's a king and this one's a I have no deal. Like they all have the same setup and I'm just going to move them. And then at the end of the week on Friday, I look at that weekly chart and if it's no longer setting the way that I want, I just remove that piece off the table. I take the loss. Mm -hmm. And if I want to add a new one, then I add it on. So I'm not sitting here taking like thousands and thousands. It's just, I might be holding 20 options trades open, but even in a $10,000 account, that could be 20 you know, or like 10, $200 options, you know, like whatever that, mm -hmm. that percentage, that statistical percentage would be. So, so, you know, a lot of the ones you mentioned that were doing good, um, could be, you know, I, I imagine a channel like CNBC would say that that's the Trump trade. So yep, do, yep. do you, do you, do you, when you're doing your Sunday analysis, do you take any of that into account? Like, okay, no. well, no, no. So you just not even, not even PPI or CPI. Um, oh, really? Because no, not even yet. Cause, because so like, for instance, with uh, the S and P 500 this or last week, when we were going into PPI and CPI, it's like, I could sit there and I could say like, oh, I think inflation's going to be hot. Probably could. But what what are they actually doing right this week the market pulled back but last week at the open of last week if you look at the weekly candle prior there was a ton of bullish accumulation and i believe we closed near the top of that candle so that is strength like if you know what i mean so it's like cnbc might be saying whatever but they're buying the shit out of it even now as we're pulling back i don't like the way that meta and amazon and nvidia are looking but they're buying a ton of it in the in the options market so that's what i'm looking more for more for is like well what are they doing not what are they saying because yeah. if they're saying something i don't care i want to see that they're they're actually buying and the weekly time frame the reason i use that is it's such a strong time frame like Obviously, every candle is only one week, but there's very little manipulation that can happen there. As opposed to like if you're trading a 15 minute time frame and the floor falls out and people get stopped out. Like I only trade weekly candle closure and daily candle closure if I'm swing trading. Like day trading is a whole different system. 
but that's that's all I focus on. And I fo- and some weeks everything hits. And of course, if the market as a whole is ripping and the whole market's trending, like you're that's what has happened with me in the and that's why every day that I post a massive win, I literally I'm like Please remember the days are gonna, like, you know what I mean? Like the days are going to suck. I think today I'm down like $159,000, my biggest loss ever. But I have to sit here and just say like, and this is the hardest part because I am so about accountability and responsibility. Like I think that as a man specifically, there is no greater superpower than saying it's your fault for just whatever it is. I really yeah. believe that. Ownership, yeah. Yeah, but when it comes to trading, I don't look at, what did, so like for instance with nvidia i didn't do anything wrong this week i you know like i had to wait for the weekly candle to close with amd i have to wait for the weekly AM, candles to close they closed at the low of the week by my strategy i did what i should have done and i still lost but i didn't do anything wrong like and you know what i mean yeah. and that is what you should be judging your trading off of is like did you stick to the the criteria of what made you enter and made you exit, not what is the result. You know what I mean? And and I think that that's the hardest part is we're we're result oriented and especially too if you're somebody who, you know, I think I think that I'm just my my risk like my 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 ability to deal with volatility is massive. And as I was saying in the beginning, going about like my past and the smallest violin and whatever, it's because I have been through a ton of shit. And it's like, my life has been nothing but volatility. And so when I look back at it, it's like, no wonder why I can handle the volatility. I, you know what I mean? Like, but if, but if I didn't have a life like that, like when, do, when do you ever go to work and lose money? Think yeah. about that. Like other than trading, if you've lived a normal life where you do, like you go to school, you get a great job. When do you learn how to risk? And I'm not saying like any of that's wrong. It's just like, you don't. My friends are like, dude, you made more in a day than I make in a year. And I'm like, have you ever lost your yearly Man. salary? Have you ever had to sleep that night? Lay in bed and think about that. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like you lose the money and then your girlfriend's like, let's go out and have dinner. It's yeah, like, no. and then you have to just be like, mm -hmm, okay. And yeah. just not, not, not worry her, not talk about it to her, not bring it to, unless it's like a serious issue. But you know, like, it's not it, it, losing is so hard and uh yep. one of the things i want to do in life is write a book called learning to lose because i think that That's a good title. as a seriously as a man like as an investor you have to learn to lose right even in life like you're gonna lose your family you're gonna lose your parents you're gonna lose friends you're going to lose everything. And that's not depressing. It shouldn't be a sad thing. You know what I mean? Like that's it, part of life. It, yeah, it's Learning. just a part of life. And, and if you can learn to take it in stride and kind of smile at it and say, like, I know the time's going to come. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's the same thing with trading. Like, I know the time is going to come when I'm going to eat shit. And so I'm not going to tie my worth to it or tie, like, any of my happiness to that because that yeah. it's going to happen you know like i've i have so many friends like dude you're up 1.6 mil this i'm like shut the fuck up i ain't up shit they're like dude we don't know where that's gonna end like publicly i might end up like with 80 of that percent gone i have no idea like you know what i mean like i have no idea or we could see even more like to think it's yours here's here's the biggest thing too i will i do have to be super honest about this aspect though right i also run a business teaching people how to trade so like all of the money that i'm trading with i don't live off of it i don't need it to live like i have a business that i'm teaching people how to trade that is facilitating my lifestyle and my employees and all of the life that i'm building so I don't even touch this money to live or to do anything with, which obviously makes a huge difference. Yeah. And then I get it because me five years ago would have been like, well, of course it's easy for you to lose. And it's like, well, I don't write the rules. <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? Like I, I you just playing the game. The yeah. Yeah. Like find a way. And it's like to, to build a skill, to make more money, to go in and, push this thing forward. Cause even with me, it's like, I love 
business. Like I love the idea of building systems and operations and building strategies and managing people. And like, it's, it gets, it gets me going. I have no idea why. And so even like without trading, if I didn't have the company of teaching people how to trade, like, dude, I don't know what I would do. You know what I mean? Like it's, because the money I make from that aspect is like so little relative to the freaking stress it brings to my life in a great yeah. way. You know what I mean? It's like, but for me, like that is also the aspect of purpose. And so what I want to do is take that and build that into everything, like build my team, have my people who are helping me build this aspect of my company and then continue to roll that into the future. Because where I see so much value in just life going forward is community like okay if i sell courses and i'm making an extra 30 40 grand a month right which is what the company is doing that's sweet that's cool but what i honestly want is high quality individuals around me and yeah. so it's like if you if you See, capitalism is a beautiful thing if it's just like left untouched and like you just let it actually do its thing. But it's like good businesses make money, make people better and actually solve a problem. And so if I do my job right, I will make money trading. My students will make money trading. My students will learn more about themselves and become better people, which is what we're all trying to do. And we'll fucking do it together. And to me, that aspect, of, and I'm not selling this at all. Like, it's like, this is not me being like, hey, like, sign up, like, please don't. But I'm just saying, like, what I've noticed is like the ability to just have someone else who understands you somewhat. You know, like, I've never met you, but like, we understand each other because even though you're in Florida and I'm in Pennsylvania, we live this same weird kind of life that a lot of other people just don't get you yeah. know and and that is so important to me i met i met this kid that i bought this cyber truck and like when i pull it up places people just like swarm around it and i met this this kid and he was like what do you do for a living and i was like i'm a trader and he's like really and i was like yeah and he's like are you legit and i was like yeah bro and like i showed him i showed him everything and he's like I've never met somebody who like successfully did this in real life. Like I'm fucking like I'm blown. And now I'm mentoring him, but it's like the feeling of like when I was talking to him and him hearing the things that I was saying, this feeling I could see on him of like, someone gets it. Someone understands it. Like that is so important and so valuable, especially since trading is just a zero sum game. Like, yeah. I'm not doing anything for the world, dude. I'm not helping anybody. I'm taking money from hedge funds and from other traders. Like, that's how you make money in the market. When you sell an option, you're selling it to some kid who's like, you know, I mean, it's not like your goal. Yeah. It's not like you being like, screw this kid. But it's like when I'm selling a cash secured put, whether it's a bank, some kid with his last money or whoever is participating in the market that day, they're buying the asset that's going to turn to zero. And so I, for I, me... I'm like, the only thing I would push back on yeah. is the only thing I would push back on is I do think investing. Oh yeah, right. investing for sure. No, yeah, you're not producing anything, whatever, but you're giving companies a lifeline to mm -hmm. go. Yeah, and, and they need they need investors. Mm -hmm. They need it. But I'm not. You know? like, like I'm specifically just like pattern trading. Well, like okay. I guess so yeah. That, that's a good transition because um, you you correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. You have a large stake in Tesla, right? So I only have 400 shares right now at an average of like okay. 201, which relative to my fund is not a ton, but it is yeah. still like a long-term stake and meta as well. Okay. Well, why? Why, why, why do you have, you know, I'll completely yeah. transitioning now. Uh, yeah, yeah. So 400 shares in Tesla, I would say that's probably more than most like, people have. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, so, so why Tesla? And then also why meta? So meta was back in like 2020 three when that low was i don't know when that low was back i have my chart meta at the time they're in the metaverse it was when yeah no that that was around then so it was like 2021 i think when they were like everyone's like the metaverse is going to be the next real estate project yeah. and That's yeah so wild. it was yeah but it was around that time and this is just one of those things too man like there's a really so all right this is my my fundamental analysis right 
there's a really good show. I think it's called Dumb Money. You ever see those guys? Chris Camillo uh -huh. and this. So they talk about like social ARB investing. So like instead of looking at the financials of a company during the pandemic, realizing, okay, people can't go to the gym. They're going to need Pelotons. What are they going to do? Let's buy Peloton. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I had a friend who called me in February of 2020. He was like, buy Moderna stock. Like they're like, like, like he was like, if, you know, if this COVID shit happens, like they might have the first MRNA vaccine. Like those are those type of ARB plays. Um, I had another friend who was like buying propane stocks and stuff because he thought that like during COVID when we'd all be eating outside in the winter, they're going to need propane to fill those heaters, like that type of stuff. But with Meta, I remember the whole switch to the metaverse when they first talked about that. And I remember just sitting there driving to Costco. <laughs> I was just like driving, thinking to myself. And I was like, Zux is a really smart guy. And he understands that the whole social platform aspect is not falling by the wayside, but like Instagram's really not doing too well. And you look at, you know, Facebook and WhatsApp, obviously it's highly, highly used. But like, I felt that at the time, with this whole metaverse thing that he was going to shift the company drastically, like fully pivot from what he was doing. It reminded me at the time of like Apple when they had that massive pullback on declining phone sales before they, it was like 2019, I think, before they really focused on ramping like the SaaS model and selling more services and, services, and, the, yeah. and the Apple card and the, and the AirPods and, and going more into wearables and like actually shifting the company from a fundamental standpoint. And so Meta was a, a ton of just luck like me, like literally just driving to, to Costco and being like, hmm, I don't know where the hell this company is going to go. But the fact that they are looking more into metaverse and creating this, at the time, what I would have said, AI, well, it's not really AI, but I mean, this like this alternate reality or AR, this alternate reality, like I feel, and, and it was just selling off. And I was like, I feel that this is a good time to go long. And so I decided to do that. The funny thing is when it comes to the shares in Tesla, a lot of it was me just feeling like a poser, not owning Tesla, but talking about it. Like, I'm not even going to lie. Oh, really? <laughs> like for the dude during 2022 and 2023, I was like, dude, I talk about Tesla every single day. I don't own a Tesla. I've like, I did the first Tesla I've ever owned was a Cybertruck. I was like, I don't own one. I talk about it every day. People want to hear me talk about it. And then I started thinking long-term about the company. I was like, Hmm. I wasn't even thinking about robo taxis at the point because I was like, that's so far out of even the scope of reality of what's going to happen. But I thought to myself, like, I want to own a long-term position in Tesla. And so I'm going to buy 200 shares. And I think at the time it was like, it was pre-split. So it was like very, very high. It was a really, really, really bad time. And then it had pulled back down to like 200 and I was like, yeah, oh, I'm going to average a little more. And yeah, I, I'm still holding on to those. My thought process is like, maybe I'll just sell covered calls. But most of the time, I'm just like, I'll hold on to it. And same with Meta. Like Meta, I will probably close soon because I don't have to worry about long-term or short-term capital gains on it. But a lot of the times, it's just luck. Like I, I'll i like me buying Moderna was just straight luck. Like I bought it for $11.25. And that was probably one of the biggest long-term investments I made. I sold it for almost $80 a share. And then oh, it went wow. to like $450. Ooh. $450 a share. But that, but see, like that's the thing too, is it's actually gonna be a never. pretty good segue too. Yeah, it's, never be upset it, about a gain. <laughs> you no, know, but it's it's like, dude, a lot of trading is just luck. Right. Yeah. But here's the thing with luck. It's okay to get lucky but you have to position yourself in a place to get lucky. So like, let's just say game, like, all right, how do I explain this? Try to explain this in a way it'll be easy to understand. But it's like, let's say that we have our 20 stocks this week that meet all of our criteria and we end up getting positions in them. That could randomly be a week like Tesla two weeks ago. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like that's luck. That is just luck. Like the company is, is, is undervalued fundamentally from a long-term standpoint, but it was luck that that was the week. But the old, but I'm not afraid to say, yeah, like I was positioned there. I was positioned in a place to be lucky, right? It's like, if you want to go, when I was younger and I wanted to network with people, I just go to the richest coffee shop in the richest neighborhood that I possibly could. And it's like, you might get lucky meeting somewhere, but like you're positioning yourself in a place to be lucky. And yeah. so it's it's even like you were saying too with when a company is significantly undervalued and the net income will actually 
eventually buy because people are going to realize like this company is printing money and nobody's buying the stock up at the end of the day you could have bought it weeks ahead or you could buy it that exact that exact day and it will bounce so i do think that a lot of it has to do with luck from for me with a fundamental with like the multiple fundamental trades that i've or long term like even dude, 2019 i remember sitting in miami and I was like, I had just lost like almost everything that I had. That was why I went five grand to 50 grand and lost it all. And I had like two G's left and I bought calls on Tesla. And I remember like making 400% return and just being like, that was luck. But you I mean, it's like, it's, it's all luck. You know, it's just, you're yeah. positioning yourself because it's like you were saying earlier with, with strategy, like 80, 20 and looking at statistics, statistics is just luck that has shown an edge over time. You know what I mean? And it's, it's like when you look at flipping a coin and it's a 50-50 chance of heads or tails, you have no idea what the next 10 flips are going to be, right? Like the next 10 flips could be heads and you're like, I'm lucky. It's like, well, I mean, like it, in the sequence, you just hit a good point. If we flip this another 90 times, you might get 10 tails in a row or heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails. So when I look at luck or when I look at strategies, that's why I focus on how does this play out over thousands of iterations because yeah. i know that my strategy works over 300 iterations or 500 iterations but i don't know how it's going to work over five trades or 10 trades or 15 trades well that's that's where i like statistics because mm -hmm. you know if you assume let, let's say that what you're saying is right that's luck and it's all about positioning yourself where well, that's where the statistics come in mm -hmm. right yeah because it allows you to position yourself in the right place because if I sell a at the money put or call, like, all right, I'm not exactly positioning myself to win. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I'm literally trying to do a coin flip. But if I go bid, you know, to a, a different delta, okay, well, that's a little different. Um, so uh, you you mentioned uh, that you have a cyber truck. How you like it? Yeah, dude, I love it. I love it, man. Like I. So in 2019, during the the whole Cybertruck event, that was when yep. I lost all of that capital. And I had, like I said, two Gs left. I put some of it in Tesla stock. And then during the event, I put $100 down for the Cybertruck. And I was like, I'm going to fucking get it. I'll figure it out. Like, I'll figure out how I can do it. Um, and I never thought they were going to make it. Like, I actually didn't think that they were going to make it. I was like, I don't think it's going to be street legal. Like, I don't know if this is going to happen. But if I have the chance to get it, I'm going to get it. And... uh I wouldn't say like I'm really big on like law of attraction and stuff. I say positioning a lot, but I'm really big on like manifesting things. And I feel oh, that yeah. like once you do it and you feel that power, you're like, I can just do like, like you know what I mean? Like I can do more. Like I could now yeah. if I think about blank and I actually apply myself towards this, like it just opens up another level, I would say, of, of confidence. And so I was going to get a model three. And I was like, yeah, I kind of want to get it. But then I was like, whatever. I was driving around a 99 Honda that was my brother's. Um, and I was like, we're just going to wait for the Cybertruck, like whenever it comes. And my whole thought and what I like push myself on is like authenticity. If I bought a $100,000 car, even if I own shares in Tesla and it's a piece of shit, I will tell you. Like, you know what I mean? Like whether you mm -hmm. hate me on the internet or not, mm -hmm. I will tell you. And I am luckily graced enough to where I... I could, or blessed enough, I should say, to where like I could do that and, it, and it'd be a piece of crap and it's not the end of the world. But if some guy is like, I want this Cybertruck more than anything and it's going to, not that you should, but like put you in financial ruin to get it, like I want to have some honest people out there. Dude, I love it. I'm yeah. never, ever driving anything that's not a Tesla ever again, dude. It's so, and the things I love the most about the Cybertruck is just like Tesla stuff. Like, I'm like, look, you can see everybody on the road and the cameras. Yeah. And like, my friends are like, bro, you can just do that. And like, but yeah, dude, I, I love it. I love it so dude, much. It's, it's so sweet. It, yeah, I think like one of the things, like the biggest thing about electric vehicles, people always talk mm -hmm. about charging, you know, yeah. like, oh, charging. That's like, I don't even think about it. Like, I don't yeah. know if you have a garage or if you park it or whatever, but like, yeah. I never leave without a full tank, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah, it's. The, the thing that people have the most like fun about it is the thing that is the, the least, the last thing you ever think yeah. about is, yeah. is charging. But they just don't get it. Like me either. Like yeah. I, you know, and, and I have like, until my, you my, get one. Yeah. It, it, and my friends like, do you have range, range anxiety? I'm like, 
where you know like i had over fourth of july i was at the jersey shore and i will say it is the only time that i actually was like crap like i was coming home there's two and a half hours of traffic and i pulled up to the only supercharger on the island in like a 30 minute mo- uh, radius and there was four other cyber trucks there which was just crazy i was like where the hell do all these people have them and it was like fully lined up and i had to wait almost 45 minutes just to charge and that was but like that's a one-off occurrence like you know what i mean like exactly. that's fourth of july it's in a specific spot where there's not a lot but besides that dude and the Tesla community is so sweet. Like, I just roll up to a supercharger and, like, I'll just shoot the shit with people and hang out because well, everyone's like, oh, can I see a truck? And I'm like, you bet your sweet ass you can, dude. Like, hop in. I let anyone, dude, I shouldn't say I let people drive it, but I usually am like, I'm take well, it around the park. You, you mentioned before that you love the community of what you get, yeah. what you guys are doing. I, I think the Tesla community is like that, right? Yeah. We just, we're all invested into this company. I would say most Tesla investors are pretty much all in investors. Yep. And it's just like this community of people that are just on top of it and just constantly tracking everything. And it, it's just become this like, you know, it's like when you know someone's like, oh, you get it. Like we yep. can just talk. We don't know anything else, but we get it. Different parts yep. of the world, political ideologies, uh, just a- everything's different. But we have this thing that we're all kind of brings us together. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's cool. A community is a, a really important thing in life. And finding people that can think similar similar but different yeah right yeah you don't want everyone to think the same because then yeah. life's boring but uh I, I resonated when you said that yeah it's uh it's funny man like i if it wasn't for like if I, I still say fin twit because i'm still like i just call it twitter but like, if it wasn't for x i i probably would have stopped doing youtube videos like there is a point and even now like i'm only gaining a thousand subs a month like i'm not mm-hmm. growing there i'm growing pretty big on x but I felt like when it came to my content as a trader, I was like, this is almost worthless. Cause like I do this work, I post it and it's worthless in a day. I gotta go make another one. And I felt like there wasn't yeah, it's that not much like, yeah. And I felt like there wasn't the ability to like engage. And I feel that like, you know, I'm one of those people, like I said earlier, I'm not gonna just sniff my own farts. I'm not gonna make the same videos that everyone else is like, here's how you read a trend line. Not because I'm like, just because people have done it better like they're better at doing there's there's so many great channels out there who have done that like that's not what i'm here for but i started really posting on x in like the past year and it's like changed my love for creating content again because there's so many great creators everyone's super chill like there's very little people shit talking and hating each other and it's just it's just dope and it's like i feel like it's such a good platform to like communicate with people and actually have a community as opposed to like I do love YouTube, but like with YouTube, a lot of times I feel like I'm just talking like at people all the times. But I agree, man. Tesla community is sweet. And every time I go to a supercharger, I meet someone, someone new. And it's like it's 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 dope. Yeah, it's it's interesting. X does everything that I wish YouTube or I don't know if I wish it, but that YouTube sucks at. It's like the comments mm-hmm. on YouTube really suck. Right. Yeah. It's it's they're just not good. But YouTube is real good with, you know, the video feed and all that to, mm-hmm. to stream it uh, or, you know, just to get things recommended to you. And I think that's the one thing that X needs to, you know, they yeah. almost need to have like a whole different tab. That's just like a YouTube stream. You yeah. Know, the, the yeah. People you follow, like, because then you get the best of both worlds, the the mm-hmm. non bullshit engagement, right. With people who actually follow you, whatever. And, you know, you, you care to see what they say, but then also all those videos readily available. Like, I think, yeah. That's the, they'll get there. I'm sure they will. They're, they will. I think Elon's so investing more into like video and, and streaming yeah. and stuff on the platform. Uh, are you going to get FSD with your Cybertruck when it comes out? 12.5, whenever that yeah. comes out, supposedly is like when it's going to come out. And I'm could stoked, be the, dude. Could like be this I, week. Yeah, dude, I, I would be amazing. I would hope. It's even the, like, it's not oh, you already have it. Never mind. Control. No, no, have no, no, yeah, so I, I bought it. Yeah, yeah. It came with it, but I don't have it yet. So like once yeah. they once I get the update, but I mean the truck's been crazy. Like the steer by wire is just nuts. When I drive like a normal car now, I'm like, what is turning this wheel five mm-hmm. times like? But it feels it's stupid, right? Like, dude, you feel like it you're does. in a stupid car. Yeah. And the only and problem the, uh, I've had is, is just the weather stripping in the back. And that's getting mm-hmm. fixed on like the 25th, which has been like, and people are like, oh, there's recalls. Dude, you buy a Honda, there's recalls. Like, what do you, like, yeah. what do you mean? You know, and I feel like too, when it comes to the, 
evs in general it's just people who don't understand because like i was a hater i'm not gonna lie like i was a hater for a long time like dude i don't want to drive like what if i what am i gonna do if i get stuck somewhere like what if the thing breaks down it's a piece of crap and there's panel gaps and like like dude i was one of those people like I'm, whatever but then like you just actually spend time with a product or with a service, like whatever it is. And like, now I'm just like, dude, fucking like, you know what I mean? And I was, I was bullish on the company for, from a data and robotics standpoint, not even that I thought that it was going to be like a robotics type company, but I just knew that all of this data is getting pumped back into this company and they're going to be able to do something ridiculous with it, whether it's robo taxis or not. But I will say like, cars are sweet. Like even now yeah. I'm like, dude, if I ever got rid of like, I don't, I don't know what car I would get. I would want a model three or a model S, but I'm like, now oh, I love the truck. I love having a truck. I love the air ride suspension. It's so sweet. You hit like a bump. And you're just like, Whoop. just keep moving. <laughs> like it's, it's so good. Dude. I love it. It's such a dope truck. Ha have you experienced FSD? No, no, oh, I haven't even. Okay. Yeah, no, I dude, I, I'm, I'm stoked too, though. I really am stoked. And I know that I'm going to get even more addicted and like Tesla fanboyish ish when I'm like, Oh my God, the cyber truck's driving me, but it's dude, I'm, dude. I watch videos every day. Like I watch Dirty Tesla. He does like a bunch of those, mm -hmm. and like I watch other people, and it's like my my guilty pleasure at night. I just watch FSD videos. Do yeah, you have it on yours? Oh yeah, or yeah, Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah, yeah, it's that's so it, sweet. I can't tell you the last time I drove. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like the only time I take over is to um, either two reasons I'll take over. Either I want to park and there's not like obvious park line so i can't just have mm -hmm. it auto park or because um i all of a sudden want to do like a quick little detour i'm like ah, oh, let me just take over real quick i just want to yeah. like i want to drive by buildings being built and i just want to like see the progress yeah. like this is the only time i ever take over. otherwise it drives us everywhere and the the thing you'll start to realize uh contrary to what you see like all the stuff on x whatever from a lot of people you'll realize how bad of a driver you really are yeah. or use it like because mm -hmm. what you'll you'll every once in a while like you'll like drive yourself um the real reason i tend if i do drive it's because i got booted out because i was on yeah. my phone too much uh mm -hmm. normally just trying like oh what's the stock market doing <laughs> you know i'm like oh i'm watching i'm like i'm paying yeah. attention but it's like i'm just also doing this like you with any car yeah. um and it'll like yell at you and it'll like you know you'll end it you have to like park and then re-engage it but yeah. um but when you're when that happened, especially if you're on the highway, like you can't just pull over to re-engage it. Uh, you just start to really realize how bad of a driver you're like you're mm -hmm. you're just not perfectly in the lane, you know, yep. you have a little drift, you look at a little, you know, somewhere over here, like, oh crap. Like it's you don't notice it when you drive normally because well, it's how you drive and like you don't hypercritic you're not hypercritical of yourself. Mm -hmm. When you're using FSD, you're constantly being hypercritical of it because it's driving. And so then when you're driving, you realize like, man, I should shut up. Yeah, it's like I'm yeah. sitting here criticizing LeBron play and I'm like, yeah. I see my own game. It's yeah. like, it's not that great. <laughs> and know? that's my thing too, from, from a safety standpoint, it's so much safer. Like so many people are like, oh my so God, safe. like, but it's like, you look around and most people are driving and you're like, no one's paying attention. And that was one of my things too, when it came to FSD was like regulations. Cause my thought process, like back in 2020 and 2021 was like, as sad as it is, if we can get FSD everywhere, like what happens to insurance companies? Like if you watch most television, the biggest insurance, like the biggest ads are insurance. So what happens? Yep. And you're right. It's going to, it's going to plummet. So there needs to be some way for, you know, like that was my thought process. Like they might not let it go through or they might not allow like, you know, rope, like, and even then too, I don't know. I don't think that there is like I know you, you legally you can do FSD if you're in the car, or, but there would have to be some sort of regulation actually passed to have a fully driverless car. Because like I don't know how Waymo is doing that. So so okay yeah so so it's actually the opposite. Okay, so you don't by default need to have permission to do something, mm -hmm. right? You only need to have permission if there's law saying you can't do something. Yeah. There's no law saying, saying that you, you can't have it, it, for most states, there's no mm -hmm. law saying you can't. California has built specific regulation laws for autonomous vehicles. So Waymo had to apply for those. They started off for a while having some behind the wheel. Arizona, same thing. But like Florida, there's no autonomous vehicles in Florida, unless you consider FSD. Yeah, yeah, but Florida already has 
rules in place to be very open for autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. And there's several other states have adopted that. So yeah, it's there's nothing federal. It's pretty much more like you can't tell me I can't do something unless there's a law yeah. saying I can't do it. Right. You're by yeah. default, you're allowed to do something. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't think that part's gonna be an issue. It's cities have or cities, states, counties, everything, they have problems with accidents. It's yeah. a huge cost on the cities. Insurance premiums are really high. This is also bad for for cities, right? Because it's just is the whole thing's just it starts to cascade into a problem. Um, but it's also hard because to your point, there's a lot of people, a lot of, there's a lot of companies, industries against Tesla. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Elon Musk, insurance companies, oil companies, um, internal combustion engine vehicle companies, uh, w with X now, right. Yep. At, you know, at least for today, the whole far left establishment is against Elon. Yeah. Right? dude, And uh, then backing Trump publicly too, makes them even exactly even more against so, it. Yeah. Everything they do with energy, right? Like literally Elon has every, all the top biggest companies in the world wanting to slow them down. But yeah. if there's one thing we've seen is, you know, uh, I don't think another presidential candidate will ever uh, have beef with Elon again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> <Because> exactly. <laughs> he definitely shifted everything. Yeah, uh, and that's why so they didn't it, want him to have that comp package and it got overturned, in my opinion, too, is because you give the guy more money, it's more power, and he obviously is okay with flexing the middle finger to people like who don't want him yeah. to. And so, I mean, he is... I feel like when we look back at him in like 100 years, people are just going to be like, dude, what that guy... Because you, like, you look at just how he's perceived as well, like over the past 10 years, how much that has changed, but... Yeah, well, I, I totally agree. There's a lot of people and a lot of, a lot of it's money only that would, in this country. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's only yeah. changed in this country. Yeah, you know, any yeah. other country, they're all courting him to come mm -hmm. and do stuff there. Anywhere he goes, he's a huge celebrity. Like people, but in this country, we've uh, taken our greatest asset in him. I mean, if you think about it, the government should be doing everything they can to, to help him. him move faster, to help him because it's. I don't know many other companies that we have here that are that forward, especially if yep. you look at us competing with China in a big scheme yep. of things. Europe's nothing but regulation hell. Nothing's happening yep. there. So it's us versus China. And well, China's paving a way for Tesla and Elon and every other company there. You yep. know, they're arguably more capitalistic than what we are in many ways. We are, yeah. Yeah. It's and, and that's, it, yeah, I, I totally agree. And that's, that's just crazy when you look at, you know, even just America and this economy and, and, and these companies, it's like, dude, you have a company like Tesla and even NVIDIA, like biggest companies in the world, like you want to cater to those. You want to create an environment where you want those people to succeed. Like the amount yeah. of, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't get like super political, or, but it's like so many people like tax the rich. It's like, well, okay, well, what are you going to give the money to, to poor people? Like I've, we i grew up poor as shit i didn't know what the hell to do with the money like you know what i mean like you can't give it to poor people like we they they can't spend it correctly i couldn't spend it correctly what whatever you think correct is you don't give it to the government because the government i think every single person can say that there's the shittiest business owners to man is the government you could put the yeah. if the dmv hat was open free market that's out if if dep was like any of these government institutions they don't know how to run businesses they don't know how to make money they don't know how to raise gdp which is why that's all we care about you know what i mean it's like how do you they don't know so, how to balance a budget that's exactly. all they gotta do so, like every so household has do you, to do that who else do you want to have the money and the influence really you know you think about it like there's there's people who hate elon just for having a ton of money and influence and it's like i get where you can come from but who else is driving humanity like I would, who else is putting rockets in space? Who else is changing the the safety of drivers every day? Who, like who who's doing this stuff? And and the thing is, it's always people who aren't doing shit who want to, you know, like, <laughs> cast the first stone of what other people should be doing. But yeah, man, I mean, guys, a cowboy, also, like it's. Oh yeah, it, it's yeah. also you know I, I hate the whole tax the rich or pay, yeah. you have to pay your fair share because to to your point, like my my. It's just, again, let's keep it simple. What are they doing that's wrong? 
following mm-hmm. your rules that you created. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That, that doesn't seem wrong to me. Like it seems like you screwed up yep. while we're at it. Why are you all so rich? How, yeah. how do you guys all make your money? Like this is a little yeah. weird to me. Yeah. But again, going back to your point, let's say, let's say you tax the hell out of Amazon, right? Or I don't know, Walmart or whoever. What do you think they're going to do? Do you really think that they're going to eat that? Or do yeah. you think every item is going to get put up another two cents on that? Like yeah. it's just going to get taxed back onto the people. That's all you're doing. You're just going to pass that on because yeah. you're not going to sacrifice your margins. And what's two cents yeah. on every product to everybody? No, nothing. So it's, it's, it's just, it's a false, like I get where people think about it, but it's just false. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's funny. I was watching something today where there's an argument on CNBC where they're talking about, okay, yeah, Trump's going to put tariffs on people and he wants to give tax cuts and that's just going to create inflation. It's going to slow the economy down. But it's exactly what we are talking about before where it's, and no, I know it seems risky. That seems like the riskier thing to do, but the exact opposite happens. You know, mm-hmm. when you, when you give people tax breaks, take away regulation, you spur the economy. You allow things yeah. to grow. You allow people to take risk. Lower interest rates. Now, small businesses can take out that loan to make that investment, to hire that extra person. But it's risky because we're yeah. a lower tax and the government's going to bring in less revenue and we have bills. I get it. But mm-hmm. that's entrepreneurship. Yeah. That's literally what it is. Yeah. And and it's, you know, it's like also you can allow competition when there's less regulation yes. and there's less... Uh, and interest rates are, are cheaper. I mean, it's, it's why it's why you even see, like, and, and that's that's the thing too that like I I I understand where people come from of like these companies are so rich and why do you need so much money and blank blank blank. But it's like no one else is going to fix the system. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like no one no one's going to fix the system. And if you just continue to tax more and more, like you said, they're going to raise prices. It's going to get passed down to the American consumer. And the thing that we know about the American consumer is they don't care. They'll just keep buying. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? It's, it's, but I think that it all comes down to people just not actually understanding money and how it works and the economy and, and what, 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 <laughs> what these policies actually do. You know, people look around they're like, oh, inflation, it's so high. And I can't believe that, you know, eggs are nine dollars. And it's like, well, we had four point what six trillion on the Fed balance sheet in 2020, and it's like eight point six trillion now. Like, you know, you're looking at printing double the amount of money in two years than we did in in 50. You know, like yeah. what what do you expect? And when I tell people that, they're like, What? We did what? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, like and 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 you know, I, I think too, systemically, especially for our parents, like they got told and raised that like credit's good and like the American credit system. And, and if you can afford it, put it on a card. And it's like, I'm not against credit. I think there's, there's upside to using credit if you're savvy with it, but it's just like, I feel that the only way to fix that aspect of like, of the economy of, of like the, you know, re, I don't want to say like resetting everything, but is is really to allow capitalism to do its thing do its thing you know like you even yeah. you even look at schools and stuff and it's like people are like schools are so expensive well okay if you have if you're a plumber and the government's like listen everyone deserves good plumbing so i'm gonna pay you to just go and fix houses in this town what do you want like like whatever it is we'll pay you what do you want uh of course you're gonna raise your prices every year you know what I mean? And yeah. if these people, they can't. So it's like when you look at health insurance, when you look at, at pharmaceutical drugs, when you look at um, basically you know, anything, it's like the reason they're so expensive is because the government will pay for them. And if the government wasn't there to loan you money to go to school or to loan you for the diabetic drug or whatever it is, no matter what your situation, whether it's your fault or not, whatever it is, it's just the truth, whether it's sad or right is that prices would go down because people can't afford them and when people can't afford them companies go out of business and that would you know like that's that's how you kind of reset things yeah Yeah. it's good and it's and it's needed because colleges and i think that that's going to happen i think schools are going to plummet because people are realizing like we don't need this i can go 
find a better education elsewhere or even cheaper and it's like that's how it should that's how it should be like it shouldn't be a business the fact that colleges don't even pay taxes on football on hot dogs on food on tim tebow jerseys like just sell like 10 million dollars worth of tim tebow jerseys you don't pay taxes what the fuck is that like you know what yeah. i mean but i just feel like so many people are asleep and the obvious answer is to tax the people with all the money because they're bad and you know, like you said earlier, like you didn't write the rules, like they wrote the rules and the people who are the ultra rich are just the ones who gamified the rules and realize like this is how you, you, you win. Because like if, you, if it's Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, people think like, oh, they have these billions of dollars sitting in a checking account. Like, yeah, that's, no. that's not how that <laughs> works. It's yeah. tied into the company. It's not like they have it yep. readily. It's not just liquid right it, yeah and, and it's not because they'd have to like pre-plan a sell or anything like that but yeah. it's the business is worth this amount why well because amazon found a way to make your life better so you can get a package overnight or that same day yep. and they found a way to do it very cost effective they had to invest and lose money for so long and now that's so valuable that you're willing to pay for it yeah you know they, they created jobs they added yep. value that's why it's worth that much but it's not like it's just sitting there in cash but yeah. to your point there's people are just so i'm not saying people are ignorant but people are i would say the mass are ignorant when it comes to the economy and money yeah. and you said it before like you're gonna tax the rich and give it to the poor what are they gonna do with it yeah. uh, a book a book i like a lot was um um i forget what it's called but something they said a lot in there was the problem with the reason people people stay poor is because they learn money habits from poor people. And I don't yep. mean just like poor, forget poor, even middle class. The reason people stay yep. middle class is because they learn money habits from that. Teachers, you're learning money habits from a teacher. Well, that person yep. is a teacher. Unless yep. they were Jamie Dimon, who decided to go and be a professor and wants to teach you, like, okay, there could be those exceptions. Um, but in general, if you're going through a basic, you know, how do you, how does, how to invest whatever in high school odds are that teacher's not going to be the best person to teach you they're probably not yeah. going to say the best thing they're going to no. tell you well diversify uh invest in s p 500 if you can get 10 percent a year every year whatever and yeah. you know then i'm like well how, how are you going to do that yeah give your money to blackrock and they'll do it for you <laughs> exactly yeah. you know and the other thing that they never talk about that you never hear anyone talk about when they say tax the rich all these companies making all this money well they they discount that the majority of Americans for their retirement put money to a 401k. Yeah. And that yeah. 401k benefits from these companies, guess what? Becoming really big and making a lot of money. Yeah. So yeah. so like you're hurting people's retirements as well. It's it's this whole talk out of both sides of, of people's mouth mouths is it's hilarious. Tax the rich, yet Nancy Pelosi has a killer yeah. track record. Yeah, she yeah she's it. she's she's killing it. And uh yeah, man. Like, I think it's, I think it's just people don't, people just don't understand. But I, I think the hardest thing is that when you start to do research and you start to like wake up a bit, you, yeah, you leave the matrix over, you unplug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, it, but it's hard because no very one hard. else is, you know what I mean? Like I, it, it becomes isolating, man. Like I'll, I'll tell you, dude, like I've, for, for me, it's it's hard even now because it's like you have to do the opposite of what every single person tells you to do, yeah. whether you're trading, whether you're investing, whether you're starting a business, no matter what it is. And to do the opposite of what everyone is telling you to do, like the amount of people who said to me, like, you sure you should be doing this? You sure you should do that? You sure you're going to do that? Like, and, and the amount of people that I respect and love that I had to look in the eyes and be like, you've never been where I want to go. I can't yeah. listen to you. I love you. I, I respect you. But like you said, they're learning money habits from poor people, right? And and not to even get personal, but like in my relationship with with like my girlfriend now and stuff, it's like the I'm like, all right, fuck cooking. I can't cook anymore. Like I gotta focus on this. I gotta do this. I have things I wanna do. I have all this. Like, and it's just I don't wanna do that. I feel like a pissant. I'm like, bro, you can't cook your own food. You can't mow your own lawn. You can't like, what kind of man are you? Like, what are you doing? Like, what the hell? And I hate myself for that at times, but then I have to look in the mirror and be like, no, bro, that is how you were raised to be. But you have these things that you want to do in life. 
And so you saying no to all of that shit that you think is going to make you better because you're responsible is actually saying yes to all the things that you want to do in life with your company and with your community and whatever. Cause I'm not going to do this forever, bro. Like, you know, the whole YouTube thing, I'll probably do this like two more years. Like there's so much I want to do. I want to take down the American healthcare system. <laughs> Dude, that's my, <laughs> like, that's my 65, 70 year old man. Like I want to fix that because I'll probably get assassinated for it. But like, I have a lot I want to do. And so it's like, it's just hard to think like somebody that you've never met or never had in your life. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah. I think that that's why it's it's just so hard because you have to do the opposite. Even looking at Tesla, right? Like how many people when Tesla was at 140 were like, didn't want to touch it. Yeah. You know, like you, you have to be okay with being a contrarian and you have to be okay with being alone. Like, you know what I mean? Like I'll, I'll be in a room with people, with my friends and with my girlfriend, I'm just zoned out. Like, you know what I mean? Like I'm just thinking about things. I'm thinking about like, because nobody wants to talk a lot of times about the stuff that I want to talk about. It's why I, oh, I just started think. YouTube in the first place because it's like, well, cool. I got my friends. I can go hop on. I can, I can shoot the shit with them. I can talk about that stuff that I want. And then I don't have to like bore the people in my life with all well, of that. But yeah, I think a lot stuff. of, I think a lot of people, um, and this is what's, you know, I, I would say there's a lot of bad things about how connected everything is and social media and all that these days, but there's also a lot of good. And I think a lot of good is, you know, you can, I guarantee you, there's lots of people out there who aren't part of any of your groups. Mm -hmm. They don't do anything with any, any of your stuff other than it's listen to your YouTube videos and they feel like they know you. Like yeah. they, they have something like, cause they don't have anyone in their life. They can talk to this stuff about, but like, mm -hmm. ah, Peter gets it, you know, yeah. and you get four or five of those. It's, it's the whole, you know, like Oprah thing. You're, you're the sum of the five people you're around, but now because of YouTube and because of X, well, now you can find the type of people that are doing the things you want to do and be surrounded by them yep. and not necessarily just be stuck based on the town you live in. Right. Yeah. Like, that's amazing. Like, yeah. look the fact that we're talking, right? Like the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, every earnings call for Tesla, like, we have a stream with Farzad, me, Emmett, Hans, like all these people. It's like, we we never would have met if it yep. wasn't for all, for of all this. Country. Yeah, it's, yeah. I love it. Um, hey, uh, let's wrap this up uh, now. Yeah. I, I Just by talking about kind of personal finance, because something, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've hit on it a, a little bit throughout. And it's something I'm extremely passionate about. Ever since I was, um, you know, since I was a teenager, the math just seems so obvious to me. It's like, okay, well, if you had a million dollars and all you had to do was make eight, 10%, well, hey, there's 80, 10 grand or a hundred grand a year. Like, so all you gotta do is get to a million. And then, you know, you, you get older, you're like, oh, well, if I had 10 million, all yeah. I need to do is make eight, you know, eight, 10% a year. Uh, so, uh, do you, how do you think about it? Like, do you have a, a number you're going for? Is it always growing? Is it never ending? Is it yeah. enough enough? And then, um, let's say that you hit your number, assuming you have one, mm -hmm. you know, I'm assuming there's a certain point where you want to do other stuff. How yeah. do you think about living off of that in perpetuity without risking it? Right? Like, do you, have you thought about like the 4% rule kind of thing? Like, how do you think about all this? It's a great question. Um, so my goal was 2.5 million. Well, my first goal was a million. And yeah, then I hit a million. Yeah. And then I took a massive drawdown and I was no longer a millionaire. I remember it was like a Tuesday and I was like, that happened to me too. Yeah, but like, but like nothing changed. And like, dude, that's yeah. that's the thing I'll say the most is like, even with me with the cyber truck, that's the only lifestyle change, dude. I'm still mm -hmm. in the same house in my same office doing whatever. Um, but that's also because I understand that I could lose a lot, right? Like that's that's part of what I do. That's part of my risk. Um I think that having goals is obviously important. My main goal was 2.5 million. And then I was like, okay, like I can sell cash secured puts, make 400 grand a year, whatever. I think that the, the un, like the realistic nature of that is like the number keeps going because yeah. I have this, it's not my saying I've seen it before. I actually just don't know where, but it's like, save yourself, save your family, save your friends, save your community, save the world. I don't think I'm going to save the world. But when I got to like making a hundred grand a year consistently, I could save myself. Yeah. But then it just made me realize 
I need more fucking money. Like, and I don't want that to come up because now I'm like, I'm talking with my girlfriend. I'm like, uh, like a hundred grand a month is a lot of money, but like, you know, not to get sad, but it's like your, your dad's going to need assisted living at some point. Your mom's going to mm. need assisted living. My dad's going to need it. My brother works with me. He's going to have a family. Like I have employees. You know what I mean? Like you, why do you want to make the money? right? You want to make the money so that you can provide opportunity for yourself and for other people. And what happens is it's, it's a good thing, but the more that you make, the more opportunity you can create and the more you realize like I need more so I can create more opportunity. Um, now it's different because I don't have a career. You know what I mean? Like I would, I would assess this differently if I was like, you know what? I work at Boeing. I'm an engineer. I love it. I don't want to do this full time. I can't deal with the volatility. I can't deal with the sleepless nights. I need consistent income. You know, these are my goals. Um, yeah, but for me, like I don't ever, like, I feel like there's only a certain amount of money that you can make trading, right? Be because. What do you mean by that? So let's just say like, okay, so especially with options. So not to go too deep, but in the options market specifically, you have what's called a spread, right? So like, you know, mm -hmm. like you'll have your bid and your ask. If there's not enough people, like if I wanted to go get $100,000 worth of calls on Palantir, or let's not use Palantir, let's use like a stock that has a, a low volume, like Zillow, right? Not a lot of people are trading Zillow options. If I'm gonna go buy 5,000 contracts, I'm gonna have to pay 65 cents per contract to get in. That's already a ton of money. Then I gotta pay, like I paid over $125,000 in commission fees this year. It's fucking crazy. Just because of options. If I was trading shares, I wouldn't have to do that, yeah. right? So you're eating that loss, then you are creating the volume. So let's say since nobody's trading it, the bid is $5 and the ask is $7. There's no one there. I am going to have to create that slippage. So I could lose 20 grand just entering a trade. So the magnitude, like the size of trading options, it's just not there unless you're trading only things like Tesla, Nvidia, Spy, because you yeah. need that volume. Um, but I also think that to a point, like you're not going to day trade with $20 million. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're in most cases, like you're no. not going to be doing that. You you should focus. And what my plan is, is to focus on, on creating a fund, right? So what are, and that's why I teach all my students, just look at the weekly, look at the daily, and you only have to put X amount of time into it and let the time be your lever. Um, for me, as far as capital, I don't look at like, I'd say right now, once I hit $10 million, like in my account after taxes, like that's all there. That was my goal by 40. Right. And I don't know if I'm going to get there. I have no idea if I don't, I don't, it's whatever. Um, but my personal goal is to get to a point where I have enough capital coming in consistently that just from selling cash secured puts that it is covering everything that I possibly need plus yeah. my business ventures. And so for for me, like, that's what I want to do. I want to build businesses, whatever that is going to be in the future. So I will forever trade, like no matter, no matter how much money I, I just love it. Like I, I absolutely love it. Am I going to teach forever? Probably not. And that's why I've gotten very, and not even to be sad, but like that, I think that's why I've gotten serious now about, uh, teaching more is like, I, I spent the past four years just showing what I'm doing, but now I'm like, okay, take the most important things that you know spend hundreds of hours even if it is turning it into the simplest form that you possibly can and share with everybody everything that you learned from the game because i'm not going to be here forever you know um there's a, a phenomenal book by simon sinek called the infinite game have you ever read yep. it I yeah, dude. So he talks about how you're a finite player in an infinite game. And that's the way yeah. that I see it. Like, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm not going to teach people forever. I'm going to trade probably till the day I die. But if I really want to leave an impact on, on the, the trading world and the investing world, like I have to take it seriously and I have to actually take my, because that's how I learn. You know what I mean? Like, that's how I learned. If there wasn't guys, like, even back in the 70s and 80s, like Mark Douglas or Nassim Talib and, like, those guys, like, I I wouldn't, I wouldn't even, like, there's always come somebody, like, a predecessor before that person. And so, for me, like, what I want to focus on is spending the next two to three years, like, condensing everything I know about trading, 
giving that back to the community and the world and then just deciding from there like what I want to do. But I think for most people, it is healthy to have goals. And one of the things that I'm actually doing at this point is trying to, as an educator, it is very tough. Obviously, legally, I can't be like, here's what you should do. You know, take X yeah. amount of percent. If I have $10,000, this is what I would do. But it's very hard because risk management is different for everybody. Like, you can't say if you have $10,000, like you could give a ballpark, like if you have $10,000, here's how you trade. Well, like, are you making a hundred grand a year and living off a of 30 and you have 10 grand? Or do you, did your mom die? Like in my case, and you just have 10 grand and you're working at seven 11 for $11 an hour. There's nothing wrong with that. But like how those yeah. two people perceive risk is so different. The kid who is working at seven 11 with 10 grand is not going to be able to deal with a 40% drawdown if that happens. But the guy who's working the job that he likes making a hundred grand a year and living off of 30, if his account draws down 40%, what's he going to do? He'll put more money in. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, and it goes back to saying the whole thing of like, oh yeah, well, more money you have, the easier it is to scale. Yeah. Sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that what you should do is when you have goals, it's, you know, monetary in the market, it shouldn't be like, well, now I'm happy or now whatever. It's just kind of like, um, like a web hook, web hook, like we were saying earlier, like, okay, now that blank has happened, now all, the only thing that changes is we shift how we allocate this capital. Like maybe once you get to a million, you're like, okay, I can sell cash secure puts. I've been working at this job for 10 years. I don't hate it, but like, I kind of want to trade and I want to learn how to trade. Well, now yeah. I can take a hundred grand of this and I can say like, this is my money to learn with. And that's why I, I tell my dude, as soon as my students come in, one of the hardest things about running like a successful coaching business is onboarding people, right? Because actually intercepting them from coming in and saying like, I'm going to make money today and follow him and intercepting him and be like, no, 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 no. This is how we're going to do it. Please chill. Please slow down. Like here's, what, here's what's going to happen. But I, I always ask my students, I'm like, do you really actually like trading? Like, yeah. if you couldn't make money from it, do you actually like it? Because I do. Most people don't. And that's okay. But if you don't love it, don't do it just because you think you're going to make money. Because it is nonsensical. Think about who you're going up against. You're going up against people like me. You're going up against people like you. You're going up against hedge funds. You're going up against all these people. And if you don't like it, what do you think is going to happen? Like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so I think the goal should be, you know, from a monetary standpoint, reduce your risk as much as you can as you're scaling, depending upon your age. And this is the biggest, biggest thing. Don't be stupid, right? Like yeah. I'm 36 now. I don't have children right now, not because I don't want them, but because like when I was in my early thirties, I was like, I can't have kids and my only source of income be trading. Like I can't, like I just, like I wouldn't be able to do that. So I have to make the sacrifice of being like, all right, well, we're gonna push this later towards life. And even now I can't have kids if I'm trading all day and you know, spending four hours a night making videos and stuff, like we're gonna push that another two years maybe. But you know, it's it's like understanding the, the sacrifice that it actually, it does take and and just sticking with the simple systems. And then if you want to get, because oh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, but going back no, to that, good. yeah, I, my, my whole point was being young. Like I could take that risk yeah. because I was young. But if I've saved up 700 grand in my retirement and I'm leaving my job as a school or whatever it is, like whatever your job is, and you have to retire off this money, but you're going to try to make money in the market. Like, dude, that is completely different. That is a whole different system. Like you're not going to trade the same. You're going to have different yeah. perimeters. Like because you you're you're not playing from the aggressive mindset. You have to play from the conservative mindset. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know if that so, answered your question. <laughs> no, it, it does. But so so and I love everything you said. Um, because it, it's true. You know, everybody talks about like everyone wants to get become a millionaire overnight. Like you yeah. see that nonstop. And the truth is, even if you did do that, you're probably going to lose it just as fast. Uh, yeah. because you get, you probably got lucky to get there and yeah. luck has a way of working against you. Um, but th there's something, you know, Warren Buffett always talks about, uh, you know, the, 
you know, what the eighth wonder of the world, ninth, whatever it mm -hmm. is, uh, compound, compounding. you know, compounding, right. The hardest thing to do really is to get to that first hundred thousand. Yeah. Right. Cause then to go from a hundred thousand to a million, you just got 10 X, yep. which yeah, it's a lot, but to go from $1 to a hundred thousand, you had a hundred thousand X. Yeah. Right? So it's a lot yeah. easier. And then once you get to your million, okay, well that's just another 10 X to 10 million. Yep. And then from that point, once you have 10 million, well, you just have to do a 10% return to make a million. I guess that's yep. it, right. And at that point, like it starts getting weird, crazy. Right? Yeah. yeah, it gets crazy. And so I guess my question to you is, let's say that you're 40, you get your 10 million. I, I understand that you'd probably sell uh, puts against it, right? For just, you know, passive income, whatever. Mm -hmm. But wh where do you have that sitting in? W would it be like oh. in a index fund? Would it be in uh, a specific companies? Would you still actually have it actively invested? So or 10 million now, I, yeah. I wouldn't. So up to that amount now, like personally, if I had 10 million liquid, I'm going to put some in real estate. I'm going to definitely old, own some sort of crypto and I would definitely diversify because that's that's the other thing that you start to think about, which is like a like a wilder like like problems that you <laughs> problems you didn't know were problems like, oh, your money's only FDIC insured up to 250 grand. 50,000. Yeah. Like, you don't think about that. But then you're like, well, you got like, what the fuck? Like, oh, do I put some money in in credit? Like, like I was looking at, at, at like last year. I'm like, oh, you know, let's open a Swiss bank account soon. Fucking credit Swiss goes under. I'm like, well, what do you? And that's why you're saying too, like these people don't even want cash. So for me, my next venture and what I'm really trying to do is load up on like money for real estate. If that massive pullback does come, I do think that owning real estate is, I would definitely have a good portion in real estate. I would definitely have a good portion in just index funds in general as basically just a hedge. And mm -hmm. I would definitely have some money in crypto as well. I don't want, I wouldn't want like us dollars necessarily. Um, but for the most part, like I would probably have most of it in a broker account selling cash secured puts against even something like the S&P 500, which isn't going to do a lot. But that's also a different, like that's also a, a different game. And I think that it also depends on the opportunity that you have because now that I look at business and now that I'm getting to this point where I can, I'm like hiring people, I'm like, that's a really good way to make money on your money. Like straight up, dude, like you hire yeah. a coder for a hundred grand a year, like, and you know, like, you know what I mean? Like you, obviously you make more than a hundred grand a year off that person or they wouldn't have a job. Like that's, and so like now I'm like, well, what are some awesome things? Like, I would probably use a good portion to build uh, companies and things that, that I would want. But I, I feel that, yeah, if I, if I had 10 million straight cash, I'd have to diversify. I don't, but I don't even know what the hell I would do. Like, what do you do when you get to 20, 30, 40 million? Like, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, what bank accounts do you have it in? Like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, yeah. I, so it's funny you, you use 10 million at 40 because th that was, that's my number, right? Yeah. Um, or let's say our number. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's 10 million by 40. Uh, you know, in, just to go back to, I don't believe so much about uh, law of attraction as much as I believe in, and uh, this is subtle nuance and I'm, you know, being picky here, but manifesting, like you said yeah, this earlier, no, no, totally. and it's, 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 it's not like a, you know, mythological or just spiritual, at least it's just what you're thinking about nonstop. And so if you're yep. thinking about nonstop, it's going to happen because it's, it's where your brain cycles are going to. And so mm -hmm. my thing was, I want to be a millionaire by the time I turned 30, literally became a millionaire 15 days before my birthday. No so lie. I, yeah. I literally had it written down on a piece of paper and I only wrote it on a piece of paper because I saw this thing dude. with Jim Carrey and Oprah. Yes. I wrote so myself only, a check too. Oh, yeah. Dude, yeah. Dude, I wrote it's myself the only a check. I did that. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, but, but so now the 10 million by 40 is the goal and I I'm a all in Tesla investor right now outside of real estate. And so when I say 10 million, I'm, I'm talking about liquid, not including yeah. real estate, but yeah. I, as you mentioned at the beginning of this, I really think Tesla's gonna be the biggest company in the world by by a lot. Like, it, yeah, RoboTax are one thing, but if they can solve RoboTaxis, the whole humanoid thing is just gonna be bonkers. And so, I have thought about you know what happens when you get twenty, thirty million because yeah. I do think that's gonna happen. And at that point, I definitely think that's you know like. Over 10 million, that's where I'll probably be taking off and be like, all right, let's put some of this in yeah. SP. You know, like let's let's not lose what we have because you never know what could happen. Mm -hmm. Uh I, not that I, I really I really do things can go that way. But 
even then at, at that point, just selling puts against that, you can be so far out of the money that yep. it's almost no risk. And you, you're doing it off such a big base that it, it just prints for you. Yeah. So, you know, and that's not even including any growth <laughs> yeah. Yeah. on that money. Right. So yeah. it gets or silly. filling on those shares and then the share is growing. And then when you own the shares, like if you own a, like I said, too, you own, if you, let's say you had 2.5 million in the S and P 500, you can just go to a bank and get a loan tax free against that because it's in an index fund. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you don't even have to pay yourself ever again. You just take loans. You don't pay taxes on them. It's fucking exactly. crazy. Like that. You know what I mean? Now you gotta pay that loan back eventually, but yeah, you do gotta pay that you gotta loan. Find obviously, the money for yeah, that, but yeah, yeah, but that's how that's how most even that's even like how most it's like if Tim Cook wants to go get money, he's probably not gonna go cash oh, out. Oh no, he's taking debt. Twenty million, he's gonna take a debt. Yeah, for sure. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't risk don't risk your money printing machine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so we kind of have the same vision. You know, once we get to that, we we want to um, not necessarily just real estate, but we want to. Uh, so my wife, she she designs like hotels and museums. Mm -hmm. She actually did the Cowboy Stadium. Um, so sweet. So what we, we want to do is like really beautiful, uh, like single family houses, mm -hmm. you know, just like take our time, just do like really good craftsmanship because at least where we're at, like you have a lot of like really nice houses, but there's so much money here that, and not enough builders that yeah. they kind of get away with, you know, some kind of shoddy craftsmanship. And they kind of slap things together and it's like, well, the money's here, right? Like, and people want what they want and there's only so many builders and so many, so much labor, like, what are you going to do? So that, that's, that's kind of our passion project is to yeah. just build some really beautiful and it's kind of like a expression, you know, from our artistic yeah. perspective. That's what, that's what you need, man. Like I'll, I'll be honest you, the most depressed I've ever been in my life was like last year when I made the most money. And it was because I realized that all the problems I thought money was going to solve didn't do shit. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like it really, it really didn't. And that's why, um, I still have, it's, I want to say first, it's, it's freaking amazing that two people on the other side of the country, both wrote themselves a million dollar check in their wallets, probably when they had fucking nothing uh, and listened that to that and both. Yeah. That's fucking, that's awesome, dude. That's sweet. Um, because it shows people it's possible. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like it really does. And I feel like when people get that taste of like, fuck, I can get what I want. Like, it's not going to be easy, but like, I can, like, that's when, that's when the gear shifts. But, um, yeah. yeah, man, like, I think you need those passion projects. And, and that's why, like, I was so depressed because I was like, dude, like, no matter how much money I have, my friends aren't going to quit their jobs and just fucking travel <laughs> with me. Like, I'm not going to be able to do all these like you know what i mean like i i just i was just still like well i'm here and i may but now what i think is the most important thing is more of like the opportunity of what you can do for other people like i want to be in a, a venture cap like i want to invest in other companies and give other people chances who not just people who you know i don't want to say like not just people who who went to business school and know how to raise seed money from blackrock but like some kid like me who was like i have an idea and i think i can do this better and i have no form like you know what i mean to be able to take those risks yeah. because when i'm sitting there watching shark tank and i'm like dude these guys are negotiating like you know shark tanks like it's not like real in that sense like it obviously is real in negotiations but it's it's one of those things where it's like for mark cuban to give someone 500 grand for 10 percent of their company it's like four bucks yeah, relatives to him it, like you know what i mean nothing. like it, not not even crazy. four bucks yeah it's and not it's, even four and, bucks <laughs> but i'll say that that also is kind of like where i'm getting in my life where they kind of took me out of that like well you can't have the things that you wanted but to where i'm like dude i can give a lot of opportunity to a lot of people like yeah. it is crazy how little like I, I'm, not, I'm not saying this in a mean way but how little it is to just make, how how easy it is to just make someone feel appreciated who works for you like it is so and I, and I realize like, as I get older now, like, that's what I want. Like, I want to create, I think of it like a, a mango tree, but it's like, I feel that so many people, you ever hear this? The no, I tree? haven't, but we got so many mango trees in my yeah. neighborhood. Yeah. So I, I think of it like a mango tree and it's like most, to me, I, I speak a lot about like being a man or whatever. And it's not because I'm like fucking alpha red pill, but it's just like, that's what I, I know. And I feel that like, as a man, your job is to provide not just enough for you but to provide in excess for your friends, for your family, for those people. And so it's like with a mango tree, like you want to be the biggest, beautiful mango tree ever so that if it's a hot day and somebody wants to lay under the mango tree and get away from the sun and you can give like, it's about provide, not just 
giving stuff to people, but providing that opportunity for those people. And I think that like, as I get older and as I amass more wealth, I realize like there's actually a way that you can have like a win, 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 win situation where for me, like I make my money in the market. It is very unemotional. It is very systematic, but then I have my passion projects and I have the things that I love and I have the things that I personally want. And that's the the other thing too, like going from like a raw finances type deal as well is like with my type of trading, I can't go get a loan. Like that, like they'd be like, Oh, you made a million dollars this year. How'd you do that? Oh, you fucking gambled? Like, like straight up. Like it's because I I hate when people are like, trading's not gambling. No, it is. It's just systematic gambling with proper risk management that you're playing sequences over thousands and thousands of times. It's gambling because you don't know what the next one's gonna be. But you know, if you play it properly, it's not. But that's why even when it comes to like passion projects or even the community, people are like, oh, well, if you're making so much money, like, why are you giving, why are you doing the community? And it's like, well, yeah, I want to give back, but it's also nice to own, like you said, right? What did you say in the beginning? It's not like these guys just have the money sitting around. It's like, I'm building an asset that I'm not selling. I wouldn't exit the company or sell it in the future. It's not even exitable because I'm the bottleneck. But it's like, you're just taking the leverage that you have, which is the market, and I'm leveraging it in a machine that is helping people but also generating consistent monthly revenue, which I can therefore go use to go buy real estate because nobody's going to give me a sizable loan when the only way they get paid back in their eyes is by me trading, which they know is so risky. So you have to diversify. In my case, you can make a company that's going to help bring in consistent revenue in order to do something like that. And then you can say to yourself, which is something that I didn't even realize for the longest time, is like, I can't trade for people, but I don't have to have a series seven to be a hedge fund manager. I could hire them. But you know what I mean? Like I, I get, yeah. as I get older, I'm like, I could hire people with series sevens. Or if I wanted to start a real estate syndicate, I have a discord of 860 people that I have helped make money that I am friends with that we, that I, you know what I mean? Like that to me is like, that's, that is where, and I'll say this more than anything, right? It's not even the money where you say more people, like the more money you have, the more money you can make. It's that and the connections that you have along that. And that's something that like I haven't realized. And so I've started to get into like bigger rooms where I'm like, oh, it's not how do I do this? It's who do I know who knows this? And as somebody like myself who grew up like, very alone and having to like, I'll just do it myself. I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. That's where I'm realizing like, wow, I can just save years of my life by like calling my friend who's a coder and be like, Hey bro, like I'm having this issue. Like, what do you think? And he can call me and be like, dude, I don't know about the market. What do you think? You know what I mean? And like that is leverage above it, above everything, above, above anything at all. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oh, the thing I was to say about goal. Um, the last thing though, but as far as like monetary goal, what I focus more so on is my day-to-day life because that to me is, is, is the goal, right? Like all you have is, is the present. And so that's why, like, even with the business now, like it's just dope. Like I wake up, get to hang out with my brother. He's my executive assistant. I got two guys in the community who've been with me for like five years. I've watched them grow in their trading and they work with me. And it's like, I just get to live life on vacation. Like, every day and i don't live a crazy life like my bills right now are not including the cyber truck like five grand a month the cyber truck's like two g's a month like dude i don't because because i don't need a lot you know what i mean and that that is the, the the main thing that i realized is like when you can live below your means you can be so fucking aggressive because while everyone out there is making decisions based upon how they're going to make an extra couple thousand dollars this month you can focus on your 10 year goal. And how am I going to build something that's going to be worth 20 million, 30 million, whatever that that is, you know what I mean? And so I think that if anything, accumulating a higher net worth just gives you the ability to sit back and be like, all right, so take, so take some time to look around at the world. Like, you know, if you hit the 10 million by 40 and you're like, listen, I wanna, I wanna quit everything else and I'm just gonna take a year to go travel or do whatever. But it's it's actually the fact that, see, the, where the superpower is with, with, with money, in my opinion, 
is it allows you when you have enough it allows you to hit the brakes and not yeah. hit the brakes and saying we don't have to make anymore but saying like well now that i have this and my safety is not infringed upon where's my meaning like what do i like you know what i mean like i've i've been surviving for so long like what's my purpose what's my meaning what do i want to do and then you can start looking at like you know like you even look at at like tesla like it sounds dumb but like do you really think that like elon could have been doing all the stuff that he's doing in the past 10 years if he like didn't know what he was going to eat the next day like no like when you no, yeah. have that safety yes it is a luxury but it allows you to stop thinking in a scarcity mindset and starts allowing you to use an abundance mindset through your life and that is where the manifestation aspect i think really comes in because when you're living from an abundance standpoint you can take a massive loss in the market or a string of losses and you can say i'll get it back right you know what i mean like yeah i, I have pessimistic friends and they're like oh this isn't gonna work out i'm like yeah probably not like i just i just i just give in to them i'm like yeah you're right man i'm not like yeah it's, it's I, funny you say that because it reminds me of uh you know I, I i just had my uh college tenure reunion about a year ago and we we're in manhattan with uh you know a bunch of my buddies uh you know everyone's there for their tenure so we, we were in the city and we were out at dinner and one of my buddies, Kurt, um, we were just talking and he said to me, he's like, you think you'll ever have F you money? And I looked at him and I was like, I just smiled. I'm like, yeah, I know I will. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I can tell you will. And, I, and, and it just got me thinking. Like, I couldn't stop thinking about that for days. And the reason I was thinking about it was because like, he doesn't know if he will because he's yeah. strapped. And so yeah. he doesn't have the ability to have enough to think about that you know and i feel like mm -hmm. that that's kind of the stages like you get to a point where you're you're you're, you're good you're comfortable but then you get to a point where you know you, you have abundance like you're saying and then you can you know start to really think about meaning of life and doing all these other things but there, there's a middle part there where you you need to get comfortable and solid on your personal finances so that you can have the room to think about, can yep. I really get to that F you money? So I can get, and until you get there, until you get, you know, here, here's a, a corny one, uh, George Peterson, until you make your bed, you know, and mm -hmm. take care of what you need to take care of, you're never gonna be able to think about that. And so yeah. like, it's the first thing I always tell everybody, it's like, forget about the stock market, forget about all of that. Do you have a budget? Do you yeah. even have a budget? Do you know how much you have coming in and going out? Like, have you even looked at that? And it's just kind of back to basics. And yeah. and with that, let me ask you, um, and we can wrap it up after this. Uh, if somebody is, I highly doubt anybody listening to this is their first time ever thinking of investing or anything for the first time. But let's assume that there is someone who's just, they're just fresh when it comes to investing. And they've probably made a lot of mistakes up to this point where nothing's ever really worked out for them. Whether it's philosophical, whether it's a book, whether it's a strategy, any what's what's your like quick advice to somebody like you met met them for the first time, they recognize you, and they're like, "Hey, I suck at all this, but I have passion. I want to do stuff." But I got like, what do you say to them? What's your? I would message? say read Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. That's like the first the first thing I would say. Um, that book, just in general, like to have you ever read it? I, I haven't. It's like, actually so, on my list. Yeah, dude. So it's 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 a stoic. He was a stoic philosopher, but basically, uh, Marcus Aurelius ran Greece. He was the the mm -hmm. richest man ever. And the book Meditations is his journal. It was never meant to be published ever. And the the things that you hear a man say that far, the problems that he's going through, and the way of life that he's living, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago as the most powerful man in the world at the time is crazy it's the same things that like we talk about and that even today like what is the meaning of life like how do i find happiness memento like so i would say first for me i think that who you are outside of the market and who you are outside of business is who you're going to be in business you know mm. so i truly as dumb as it sounds i think you need to focus on philosophy first because 
especially when life is moving so fast, when you start to find success, like we said, the lady in the, in the red dress earlier, yep. it's easier to not only go and hopefully find other opportunities, but it's easier to slip up. It's easier to be immoral. It's easy to, to be like, yeah, whatever. Like, I don't have to do this or I don't have to do that or oh, what? Like, but I feel that at the end of the day, focusing on stoicism helped me so much because what I'm noticing in business and with trading is that like, there's no secret to any of it. Like, like Alex Hermosi, do you know who he is? Yep. Yeah. You ever of heard course. of him? So like, I literally just read hundred million dollar offers, hundred million dollar leads. I took everything in that book. I created lead mags. I did all that companies doing 40 grand a month. Of course I have to learn trading and the skills, but just because I know how to trade does not mean that I know how to build a business, right? Like that they're two different things. There's a lot of great traders who don't actually run a profitable business or run one that actually helps people. Mm -hmm. And so for me, like he is really, really big as like an individual on saying that there's nothing special. It's just doing the boring shit at scale. Yeah. And that's, that is discipline and that's life. Like today I wake up, I hit the gym, I do my red light therapy. If I, or just be like going for a normal walk, if I don't have a red light therapy machine, I will take my normal trades. I'll do my thing. I'll go. And it's like, I don't do anything special. Yeah, I'm just consistent. doing, I'm consistent and I'm doing all of the small things at scale. And then when you eventually yeah. hire employees and have a community, you can do that times a hundred because they're doing the same things at scale. So if someone were to come to me and they're like, dude, I, and this is the biggest thing that I hate too, because a lot of people who come and they start losing money in their trading and stuff, it's like, I understand why you're so impatient because you're fucking mad. You're upset. You're tired of your situation. You're tired of this life that you know you could have more. You're fucking sick of it. And that's why people act hastily. It's, it's like the same reason that wakes them up to say, I need something different. It's the same poison that kills them. You know what I mean? It's the same thing that's like, I'm so motivated that makes you be so impatient. And so it's like, you have to learn to be macro patient micro super impatient you know what i mean like and i, I yeah. feel that well yeah, i feel that if somebody were to come to me and say like dude i need help i need to do this i'm tired of my job whatever it is i would say like trading is not going to be your short-term answer starting some one-off business isn't going to be your short-term answer like you're probably going to lose a bunch of money you're going to probably lose a bunch of businesses but who you are is the success like the work works on you more than you work on it. Trading has made me such a better man than I have made trading better. And it's like, I spent those four years of me not making money trading consistently. I was reading three hours a day. I was meditating. I was like, I, it, I spent the life of like a philosopher because I, I, first of all, I had no other opportunity. There was nothing else happening for me. But looking back, I think that that was the pivotal driver because I realized that like the man that I'm becoming every day is the goal. Like you even saying like earlier, like, okay, like you get to 10 million, let's say you lose it all. Do you think I'm going to be broke forever? Yeah, right? Like no. broke is a state, poor is a mindset. Like yeah. I'll never be poor again, bro. Ever. I might be broke. I'll never be poor again. Because once you make that mindset shift and once you know that you are capable of doing the things that you say you're going to do, it all changes. Like it all changes. And it, it and it's, it's a very empowering thing, but it takes a long time to get to that point. So if somebody wanted some help or want anything, I would say, listen to Marcus Aurelius, learn stoicism, and just take it one day at a time. Like, you know what I mean? I think that it, the tough thing is like, there is no just straight investing advice because if I were to give you a risk protocol, but you're not going to follow it, what's the point? You know what I mean? Like what's, what's the point? And that's why I can always tell usually when someone comes into the academy, who's going to make it and who's not, because it's usually the people who are like, all right, um, 
you know, I've, I, I want to do this for a living. I'm willing to give it the next three years, four years. And, and if this happens that it's whenever, and the biggest sign is when somebody comes into my community and they've been trading, like we give them a survey when they come in, 82% have never been profitable. 40% have been trading for more than four years. Hmm. Think about that. That's actually like way more than I thought. That's a good sign. Like as crazy as that is, like that's a good sign. You haven't given up. That's, that, yeah. you know, like like an infinite game, Simon Sinek. It's like the goal is not a certain number. The goal is to continue to play the game and to continue to play the game forever. And that's what I really try to, to, to explain to a lot of people is like there's there's not going to be one thing that's going to change your life tomorrow, right? Like even if you took 10 grand, you bought a ton of options in Tesla, it goes from 300 to, you know, $1,000, you make all this money, then what? Did you learn anything? Really? Like, cause, cause if I'm, if I'm feeding you trades or you get lucky, or even you find a company that's undervalued, you make a ton of money. What do you do next? Cause it, you know what I mean? Like, and yeah. if you don't, if you, and, and that's the thing is like, you're the, the product, like you're the, you're the reason that you're doing all of this is so that you can be you and, and hopefully one day, like you know, look after the people that you want to look after and that's that's probably what I would say, you know, to spend time learning. The the hardest thing for me, and I don't want we'll, we'll wrap this up soon, but the hardest thing for me and where I I have trouble with my students is like I can say just learn to take a loss, learn to take a loss. But I don't know why you can't. Like for me, I was told I wasn't going to amount to shit. I was told that trying to be a musician wasn't going to work. I was told that trying to be a trader wasn't going to work. I had seven failed businesses, a, a social media marketing agency. I worked with the freaking lawyer who ended up being a criminal and robbed a <laughs> bank. Like, dude, all these things. And like, really, up until all of that, every piece of evidence showed me that everyone else was right. You know what I mean? Like, every piece of evidence had showed that. And so it's like, It's just so tough because there's never going to be one thing. It's like that series of things, but it's, it's, I would say get yourself as fast as you can to the point where you're spending eight hours a day on you. So even if that means that like what I did in the beginning, drive DoorDash 12 hours a day on a Saturday, cause I knew it paid the most and it wasn't leverageable to do anything else. And I barely have enough money to get by, but now I'm spending eight hours a day working on myself, whether mm -hmm. that's working out, whether that's reading, whether that's meeting other people, whether that's spending time with a mentor, because that compounds like that's all building you. That's not building someone else's company or someone else's future. That's building you. And uh, I think it's really important. I think it's an aspect that just gets overlooked uh, a lot of the times. Oh. That was well said, man. That was heavy. Yeah, thank you, bro. Yeah, yeah. thanks. <laughs> no. I try not to get too heavy, but I, I feel no, uh, it's good. We we need yeah. more of it, I think. Um, yeah. But hey, uh, thank you for uh, taking the time for uh, responding yeah, to me and and it's jumping great. on here. It's been great to to meet you in person. I feel like I've known yeah. you for a while just through YouTube. Yeah. So it's great to know thank you. you. Uh, for anybody who might still be on, how can they uh, contact you? Find you? Yeah. So I run a YouTube channel called Traders Helping Traders. Um, and then I also am on X P DeCarlo trader or just look up my name, Peter DeCarlo. And, uh, hopefully at some point I'm going to start, uh, another channel, probably podcast type channel to talk more about life. I don't know that <laughs> you know what I mean no. more other than just trading. I'd love to join you on that one of these days. So yeah, bro, that'd be amazing. Uh, all right, man. Well, I appreciate you, the brother. time. Uh, wanted it there. Cheers. Yeah. Same man. I'll see you. Have a great weekend, dude. You too. Bye. Peace.